हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू दिस नीट पीजी स्प्रिंट 2023 ऑफ्थलमोलॉजी सेशन आई एम डॉक्टर सुधा एंड आई एम रियली रियली एक्साइटेड टू बी विथ यू ऑल सो प्लीज लेट मी नो इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल Okay, so now that I am audible and visible, and you are able to see the presentation also. Yeah, so we are good to go. Okay, so see uh, this session that we will be doing. This is going to be. Uh, it is supposed to be a PYQ session, but it is not just going to be a discussion of the answers of PYQ because I know that those of you who are in the last phase of preparation and revision, you have already finished doing the previous year's questions. So uh, what is important is that we discuss the PYQ topics. because even if the question is not repeated there is a very high likelihood that these topics will be repeated something similar or something on the say similar lines will be asked right so let's do something let us start with the first question so have a look at this question which of the following would be prescribed for simple myopic astigmatism so look at the options which of the following would be prescribed for simple myopic astigmatism okay so what is your answer okay so yeah so this is something where lot of students have confusion and that is why i thought that we have to discuss this well so the answer is d okay so what we'll do is sabse pehle we will try to look at how to answer these questions so see we will get in these questions na first of all either you will have a concave lens concave means what concave means minus right or you can have convex lens that is plus right these two things can be there now please remember if you have a concave that is a minus lens then this means that it is either some form of myopia or it is myopic astigmatism so minus ka matlab kya hai minus matlab either myopia ya myopic astigmatism राइट right? और प्लस का मतलब क्या है प्लस का मतलब है हाइपरमेट्रोपिया या हाइपरमेट्रोपिक एस्टिग्मेटिज्म ठीक है सो सी दो ऑफ यू हु आंसर्ड ऑप्शन बी वो देखो लेंस प्लस है तो फिर वो मायोपिक एस्टिग्मेटिज्म हो ही नहीं सकता तो दैट इज द फर्स्ट वे टू एलिमिनेट सो अंटिल एंड अनलेस यू हैव समथिंग इन माइनस इट कैन नॉट बी माओपिया और माओपिक एस्टिग्मेटिज्म ओके सो दैट इज द फर्स्ट थिंग so now next whether it is a concave or a convex lens there are two possibilities right ek to hoga ya it will be a sphere or it will be a cylinder it will either be a sphere or it will be a cylinder now how is sphere written sphere is written like this and how is cylinder written cylinder is written like this right now i'll tell you the simple way of answering these questions i will begin with minus so if you look at minus suppose you have this kind of a prescription that is minus 1 diopter sphere so if there is a prescription where there is only a minus sphere then this means simple myopia this is a simple myopia okay now suppose there is minus 1 diopter cylinder and there will be always an one axis mentioned in front of the cylinder suppose this is 90 or it is 180 whatever axis is mentioned this is simple myopic astigmatism so if there is only a minus sphere that is a simple myopia and if there is a minus cylinder that is a simple myopic astigmatism 
or agar the prescription has both suppose the prescription looks something like this that is minus 1 diopter sphere and say minus 2 diopter cylinder at any axis agar prescription aisa hai this is called as compound myopic astigmatism this is called as what it is called as compound myopic astigmatism so i'll just repeat this once more if you have just a minus sphere that is a simple myopia if you have just a minus cylinder that is a simple myopic astigmatism and if you have both a minus sphere and a minus cylinder matlab prescription agar aisa hai so that is a compound myopic astigmatism okay now we will extrapolate the same thing to plus also the same thing can be extrapolated to a plus prescription so now i want you to look at this and tell me suppose i give you this prescription plus 1 diopter sphere iska kya hai if you get this then what is the refractive error here so who will tell me what is this if we have a plus 1 diopter sphere then what is this the same thing that we discussed for minus prescriptions the same thing can be extrapolated to plus also the only thing i told you that if it is plus it is either hypermetropia or hypermetropic astigmatism so agar plus 1 diopter sphere hai then what is what is it going to be correct this is a simple hypermetropia good this is a simple hypermetropia very good now suppose i say that plus 1 diopter cylinder at any axis suppose say i say 90 or i say 180 then what will we call this isko kya bolenge abhi if i have say plus 1 diopter cylinder at any axis 180 or 90 then what are we going to call this if i say plus 1 diopter cylinder at any axis 180 or 90 then what is this going to be this is going to be simple hypermetropic astigmatism that is SHA. This is called as simple hypermetropic astigmatism. So like I told you if it is a minor cylinder it is simple myopic astigmatism SMA. Same thing if it is a plus cylinder it is SHA. Right? Now if suppose we have a prescription like this that is I have say plus 2 diopter sphere and say plus 1 diopter cylinder at any axis that is we have both a plus sphere and a plus cylinder then so plus sphere plus cylinder if both are there then what is our refractive error if we get this then what is the answer we have to give in the exam hello quickly quickly tell me what are we going to say if we have both a plus sphere and a plus cylinder then what will we call Correct. This is going to be called as a compound hypermetropic astigmatism. Very, very good. This is a compound hypermetropic astigmatism. Right. So, I hope now you have understood this. So, I'll just repeat the basic rules once again. See, if we have anything in minus, that is concave, it is myopia or myopic astigmatism. If we have in plus, it is hypermetropia or hypermetropic astigmatism. Now see, as we looked at it here, if it is a only a minor sphere like this one, it is simple myopia, only a minor cylinder SMA, only both minor sphere and minor cylinder that is CMA, compound myopic astigmatism. The same thing is extrapolated to plus also. So only plus sphere will be simple hypermetropia, only plus cylinder will be SHA and both plus sphere plus cylinder, this is going to be CHA right tell me up to here are we clear has everyone understood this part shall we proceed further to slightly more difficult prescriptions up to this everybody has understood yeah so now i am going to go on to something which is slightly more difficult now suppose you have a abhi tak na, the prescriptions that we have discussed isme both of them are plus yeah both of them are minus see if we have plus both are plus and if we have minus both are minus so here both are plus or both are minus right now suppose i give you a prescription like this suppose we get a prescription like this that is say minus two diopter sphere and say plus four diopter cylinder at any axis suppose we get a prescription like this now what do we see in this prescription here you see that the sphere and the cylinder are of opposite signs see sphere and the cylinder are of opposite signs correct 
the sphere and the cylinder are of opposite signs that is a minus sphere is with a plus cylinder or you can have the opposite also that is you can have a plus sphere with a minus cylinder so when you have this and the cylinder is greater than the sphere so see here the absolute value of the cylinder is greater than the sphere if this is the case then this is called as your mixed astigmatism what is it called it is called as mixed astigmatism Okay, so what did we see in this prescription? The, in this prescription, there is a minus sphere with a plus cylinder or it can be the opposite also. You can have like this also. That is a plus sphere with a minus cylinder. This is also possible. Whatever it is, if there is the sphere and the cylinder are of opposite signs and the cylinder is greater than your sphere, then this is a prescription of mixed astigmatism. Tell me, is this clear to everybody? Has everyone understood what the prescription of mixed astigmatism looks like? Has everyone understood this? Right? So, see, in this mixed astigmatism, a minus sphere with, is with a plus cylinder or a plus sphere is with a minus cylinder and the absolute value of the cylinder is greater than your sphere. The absolute value of the cylinder is greater than the sphere. Okay? So, this is the prescription of mixed astigmatism. Okay? Now, I will go on to something a little more difficult. Sometimes you can have something more added to the question and that is they can ask you what is meant by with the rule that is WTR or they can ask you against the rule that is ATR with the rule or against the rule. Right? Now from the prescription, if we have to say which is with the rule and which is against the rule, then what do we have to do? Please memorize this rule because this is what is going to help you in the exam. So if you look at this, the rule is that if the prescription has a minus cylinder cross 180 degree or a plus cylinder cross 90 degrees, then this is with the rule, right? A minus cylinder cross 180 or a plus cylinder cross 90, then that is with the rule. The opposite is against the rule, okay? So, I'll give you an example. So, look at this prescription. Suppose you get this prescription that is minus 2 diopter sphere and say minus 2 diopter cylinder cross 180, Okay, so this is the prescription. Now, the first part is you have to first tell me what is this. Is it SMA, CMA, SHA or CHA? What is it? Is it SMA, CMA, SHA or CHA? What is this? Who will tell me what is this? We just did this before. SMA, CMA, SHA, CHA. What is this? Correct. This is CMA, compound myopic astigmatism. Because see, there is a minus sphere and there is a minus cylinder also. Correct. Now to decide whether it is with the rule or against the rule, we have to look at the cylinder part of the prescription. So look at the cylinder part of the prescription. It says minus cylinder cross 180. So what is it? It is WTR. So this is the option you have to mark. CMA WTR. Okay, so I am going to go over this once more because this has been asked recently and it is likely to be asked again. So the first part of the prescription is you decide whether it is SMA, CMA, SHA or CHA. And then you look at the cylinder part and decide whether it is WTR, ATR according to this rule. Okay, so now I will give you another example. Look at this prescription for me. Suppose we say plus 2 diopter sphere and say plus 2 diopter cylinder cross 180. Now tell me what is the answer. Should we say SMA, SHA, CMA or CHA? What is it? SMA, SHA, CMA or CHA? What are we going to call this? What are we going to call this? What is this? SMA, SHA, CMA, CHA? What should we call this? 
see there is a plus sphere and plus cylinder na so what are we going to call this there is both a plus sphere and a plus cylinder so what do we call this correct this is cha very good so this is cha and to decide whether it is wtr or atr i have to look at this part so it is plus cross 90 which means it is against the rule so it is cha atr this is the option we have to mark cha atr okay one more okay let's see now if you can answer this i will feel that you have understood this suppose we have this prescription minus 3 diopter cylinder cross 90 only this now tell me what is it is it sma sha cma cha and then tell me whether it is wtr or atr what is this sma sha cma cha and then tell me whether it is wtr or atr what is it what is this sma sha cma cha and then wtr or atr see here there is only a minor cylinder no there is only minor cylinder so what is this very good this is sma simple myopic astigmatism and minus cross 90 means what atr or wtr correct it is atr so this is our answer sma atr this is sma atr sma atr okay now the last one suppose i give you this prescription minus 2 diopter sphere and say plus 4 diopter cylinder cross 90 look at this prescription now what are we going to say what is it sma sha cma cha or ma what is this what is this sma sha cma cha or ma minus 2 diopter sphere plus 4 cylinder cross 90 what are we going to call this very good this is a mixed astigmatism because see that's a combination of minus and plus and the cylinder is greater than the sphere so this is a mixed astigmatism and see to decide whether it is a wtr or atr i just have to look at this part of the prescription and this is with the rule because it is plus cross 90 so this is mixed astigmatism and it is with the rule mixed astigmatism with the rule right so now let's go back to this question now it's going to appear very 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 easy to you so this is obviously sma now simple myopic astigmatism now tell me here should we call this wtr or atr if we had been asked whether it is wtr or atr what would we say if we had been asked whether it is wtr or atr what would we have said wtr or atr vigneshwar and i'll just answer your question ha huh? just give me a minute correct this is minus cross 180 so it is with the rule right so it is minus cross 180 so this is sma wtr right so now tell me up to here whatever we have discussed is this clear to everyone then i am going to take it a step further and explain the most difficult part of this topic which a couple of people have already asked me so tell me yahan tak sabko clear hai everyone has understood this you will be able to solve questions from here because this is what is going to come what i am going to discuss after this has got very less likelihood of coming but just to finish the topic i will discuss it yes na everyone has understood this now see i told you that here see when we have something like this that minus 2 diopter sphere and say plus 4 diopter cylinder cross whatever right this i told you is a mixed astigmatism now how do you know this is a mixed astigmatism because there is a combination of minus and plus so sphere and cylinder they are of opposite signs the sphere and cylinder are of opposite signs 
and the absolute value of the cylinder is greater than the sphere this is what i told you this is mixed astigmatism right now as one of you have asked me not one but a couple of you have asked me is it possible that the cylinder is less than the sphere or the cylinder is equal to the sphere it is possible now when it is possible when you get that kind of a prescription then what you have to do is you have to apply a method which is called as transposition so see suppose you have a prescription like this minus 2 diopter sphere and say suppose you get plus 1 diopter cylinder cross 180 right See, minus 2 and plus 1 cross 180 I have given. Now, see here, your, the absolute value of the cylinder is less than the sphere. This is also a plus minus combination, mind you. But the cylinder is less than the sphere. Now, therefore, this is not mixed astigmatism. Is ko mixed astigmatism mark mat karna. If you get this, then, then what you have to do is, you have to do something which is called as transposition right transposition now i'll tell you what do we mean by transposition the first step of transposition is you algebraically add up the sphere and the cylinder so see here we have minus 2 and we have plus 1 so we will algebraically add this up so if i do minus 2 and plus 1 it becomes minus 1 and this minus 1 is my sphere then the next step is I will change the sign and the degree of the cylinder to exact opposite. So plus 1 cross 180 will become minus 1 cross 90. I will just repeat this once more. Now these two are actually equivalent prescriptions. So when we have a prescription of plus minus where the cylinder is less than the sphere then that is not a mixed astigmatism you have to transpose it so what is the first step of transposition the first step is you algebraically add up the sphere and the cylinder so minus 2 and plus 1 will become minus 1 that is your sphere for the cylindrical part you change the sign and the axis to exact opposite so plus 1 cross 180 will become minus cross 1 cross 90 now I want you to tell me what is this. Now it has come in a format that you know. Minus sphere minus cylinder. Abhi batao ye kya hai. Abhi mujhe batao ye kya hai. This is now a format you know na. Minus 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 sphere minus cylinder. What do we call this? Are? We just discussed minus sphere minus cylinder together what are we going to call this chalo i'll wait for a couple of minutes think karo correct it is compound myopic astigmatism very very good so see now it has come to a point where you know so if you get this kind of a plus minus prescription where the cylinder is less than the sphere sirf only there you have to transpose the rest of them you don't have to do anything so see if there is a minus plus where the cylinder is greater than the sphere simply mark it as mixed astigmatism but if there is a minus plus prescription where the cylinder is less than the sphere, then transpose and bring it to a format that you know. So now it becomes CMA and correct. It is minus cross 90. So it is against the root. Minus cross 90. So it is against the root. Now tell me. Abhi prescription sabko samaj aya. I hope that now nobody will get prescriptions wrong in the exam. Isse zada to kush nahi aana chahi exam mein. Right now, now you will be able to answer questions from prescriptions. Okay, chalo. Let's go to the next one now. I'll go to the next question. Let's go to the next question. Chalo. Look at this. A 15-year-old girl is not compliant with spectacles for her myopic astigmatism. What should be the appropriate management in her case? A 15-year-old girl is not compliant with spectacles for her myopic astigmatism. What is the appropriate management in this case?
Very good. I know that most of you who are in the last phase of preparation, you know the answer. The answer is spherical equivalent glasses. Now see, the thing is, there are a couple of things which we, ha which we have to learn from this question. Now, see, sometimes if children have very high myopic astigmatism, if they have, I should say, if they have high astigmatism, they sometimes do not tolerate that glass. Then what is the ideal thing that should be done for these children if they are not tolerating their glasses or they are not compliant with their glasses or they don't want their glasses is we have to shift them to contact lenses. So that is the actual management. So ideally, if a 15 year old girl is not happy with her glasses, we should try contact lens for the patient. That is the answer. But unfortunately, this question ke option may contact lens kahi bhi nahi hai. We don't have contact lenses in the option. Our option mein kya hai? Option mein we have femtosecond LASIK, LASIK implantable collamer lens. So all these are refractive surgeries. So this femtosecond LASIK, this is a corneal refractive surgery. This is a corneal refractive surgery. Your LASIK is a corneal refractive surgery. And this ICL or implantable collamer lens, this is a lens based refractive surgery. So this is a lens based refractive surgery. Okay. So basically all these are refractive surgeries. So now refractive surgeries, the primary eligibility criteria for any refractive surgery is that the age of the patient should be more than or equal to 18 years. And secondly, it is also important that the refraction should be stable for at least one year. So for the past one year, the refraction should not have changed. These are the primary criteria for any refractive surgery. So under refractive surgery, whether it's a cornea based refractive surgery or a lens based refractive surgery, we cannot do it for children. So that's why all these are actually contraindications. We cannot do any of these. So that's why we are left with only spherical equivalent glasses, which is our answer. Right. So ideally we should be shifting this child to contact lenses, but because that's not there in the option, we are marking spherical equivalent. Now I want to tell you, what do you mean by spherical equivalent? So suppose spherical equivalent means that suppose you have a prescription like this, that is minus two diopter sphere and say minus four diopter cylinder at any axis, whatever axis. Spherical equivalent means you algebraically add half of the cylinder to the sphere. So see minus 2 diopter with that you add half of the cylinder. So it is the, the spherical equivalent will be minus 4 diopter. Okay so minus 2 diopter sphere and minus 4 diopter cylinder cross 180 if you have this prescription if you have to give a spherical equivalent you have to add half of the cylinder to the sphere so minus 2 was already there from the cylinder you add 4 so sorry from the cylinder you add 2 so this becomes minus 4 this is your spherical equivalent so it is kind of equivalent to this prescription it's not equal so this is what we mean by spherical equivalent so see this is why this none of the other things can be done for this patient because the child is 15 years old and the eligibility criteria for any refractive surgery whether it is cornea based or lens based is that the age should be more than 18 and the refraction should be stable for at least one year. Apart from that for cornea based refractive surgery the corneal thickness is also important. But that's a different thing but this child cannot be taken up because it's a child to begin with it's not an adult. Is this question clear to everyone? Shall we move to the next question? Chalo, now this is actually a question from an FMG exam. But it's a tough question so I just thought we'll discuss this. A 25 year old man presented to the OPD for refraction. He's currently using minus 3 diopter in the right eye and minus 2 in the left eye. What is the expected movement of the retinoscopy reflex in the right eye of this patient? So look at the options, read it carefully and try to tell me the answer. Then I'll tell you how we arrive at the answer. Yes, we can give spherical equivalent for mixed also. For any astigmatism, we can give mixed dipti. But then spherical equivalents cannot be exactly equal to any glass.
okay so a couple you have one of you has given me the right answer the answer is it moves opposite to the direction of the retinoscope yeah this is the answer but there are a couple of things to be learned from this question so see this is a patient who is 25 years old which means that the refraction is likely to be stable in this patient now they have not mentioned about any cycloplegic so we will assume that no cycloplegic was instilled we will assume that no cycloplegic was instilled and because the distance is not mentioned we will mention assume that it is a standard 1 meter distance okay now there are there is a small table that you have to memorize for these questions so what is it the table is that when you do a refraction at 1 meter distance which is our standard distance and at no cycloplegic and you have not instilled any cycloplegic then if you get a width movement what do you mean by width movement width movement means that the retinoscope moves in the same direction the reflex moves in the same direction as the retinoscope when i do a retinoscopy if i move my retinoscope like this the reflex will also move like this that is width movement so what does width movement mean width movement can mean three things it can mean that the patient is either hypermetropic it can mean hypermetropia it can also mean emetropia and it may mean myopia which is less than minus 1 so if you get a width movement that is the retinoscopy reflex moves in the same direction as the retinoscope then the possibilities are hypermetropia emetropia or myopia less than minus 1 now where are you going to get an against movement against movement means that the retinoscope moves opposite to the direction of the reflex moves opposite to the direction of the retinoscope this will happen if your myopia is more than minus 1 and from common sense who will tell me where will i get no movement that is the retinos the reflex does not move at all even if i move my retinoscope where will i get no movement चलो कॉमन सेंस क्वेश्चन है इवन इफ यू डोंट नो यू विल बी एबल टू वेर विल आई गेट नो मूवमेंट इफ द मायोपिया इज इफ द मायोपिया इज इक्वल टू माइनस वन देन देर विल बी नो मूवमेंट ओके सो नो मूवमेंट मीन्स दैट द मायोपिया इज इक्वल टू माइनस वन मायोपिया इज ऑलवेज माइनस मायोपिया इज इक्वल टू माइनस वन so see this table you memorize when you do a refraction at 1 meter distance with no cycloplegic with movement means hypermetropia emetropia or myopia less than minus 1 against movement means myopia more than minus 1 and no movement means myopia equal to minus 1 theek hai abhi isko we try to apply it to this question so see here in both eyes both in the right eye and the left eye the myopia is more than minus 1 right so in both eyes i am going to get what movement in both eyes i am going to get against move okay so in both eyes i am going to get against move so not just in the right eye they have asked it about the right eye in the question but it is not just the right eye even in the left eye i will get against movement only because in both eyes the myopia is more than minus 1 okay is this question clear to everyone has everyone understood this then i'll go to the next question has everyone understood this just memorize this list isko we have to memorize because that is the easiest way to answer the question in the exam in the minimum time because it's not just enough to know the answer and and do it we also have to do it in a finite amount of time na so that's why i think that this is like the easy easiest method if you know this you will be able to apply it. ठीक है चलो लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट वन सो दीज वर द क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम रिफ्रैक्शन नाउ लेट्स गो टू क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम अनादर टॉपिक वेरी वेरी सिंपल टॉपिक वॉट इज द डायग्नोसिस फ्रॉम द इमेज हियर वॉट इज इट इज इट अ टेरिजियम आर दे कॉन्क्रीशन इज इट पिंग्विकुला और बाइट ऑट स्पॉट येस वेरी वेरी इजी आई नो दैट दिस इज अ वेरी वेरी इजी क्वेश्चन येस इट इज अ टेरिजियम 
and what is that erygium you all know that it is an elastotic degeneration of the conjunctiva yes you will be getting the unnoted ppt huh? you will be getting the unnoted ppt so it is an elastotic degeneration of the conjunctiva wherein a fold of conjunctiva grows on to the surface of the cornea a fold of conjunctiva grows on to the surface of the cornea so see this is our fold of conjunctiva it is growing on to the surface of the cornea so this is our pterygium right now quickly quickly let us revise what are the important things that we need to remember from pterygium so now tell me what kind of refractive error does a pterygium cause what is the type of refractive error which is associated with pterygium very very important mcq so see what it is doing this pterygium it is growing on the horizontal axis and it is flattening the horizontal axis it's growing on the horizontal axis so it flattens the horizontal axis of the cornea it flattens the horizontal axis of the cornea correct so what is the refractive error it will cause very good you have told me the right answer that the refractive error associated with the pterygium is astigmatism now i want to take it a step further think and tell me whether this is going to be a with the rule or against the rule with the rule means that the vertical is more curved than the horizontal by definition that's what it is we learn to apply it to the prescription basically with the rule means that the vertical is more curved than the horizontal right so here see the horizontal axis is getting flattened so this pterygium it causes with the rule astigmatism because see the horizontal axis is getting pressed horizontal is getting flattened so that is why it is wtr with the rule astigmatism so this is again important thing to remember from pterygium that the refractive error that it causes is with the rule astigmatism it causes with the rule astigmatism next tell me sometimes close to the head of the pterygium there is a pigmented line what is the pigmented line close to head of the pterygium called important one liner pigmented line close to head of pterygium what is that called pigmented line close to the head head of the pterygium it is called as stalker's line so please memorize this also if you don't know because this also comes as one liner stalker's sorry stalker's line pigmented line close to the head of the pterygium this is called as your stalker's line treatment treatment of pterygium obviously is pterygium excision excision is the treatment but the most important complication associated with excision is recurrence recurrence is the most important complication associated with pterygium excision so what are the methods to prevent recurrence prevent recurrence what are the methods see one of the methods that is used here is application of mitomycin c to the bed of the pterygium after after its excision so you excise the pterygium and to the bed of the pterygium you apply mitomycin c so mitomycin c application is one one method but what is the most commonly used method the most commonly used method is called as conjunctival autograft what is it called it is called as conjunctival autograft that is you take a small piece of conjunctiva from another place and you put it here from the same eye so small piece of conjunctiva is excised from the same eye and we put it here but if the pterygium is very large and you are not able to do a conjunctival autograft then we have the option of doing what you have told me that is amniotic membrane graft so mitomycin c conjunctival autograft and amniotic membrane graft these are the different options okay so the drug used is mitomycin c then we have cag amniotic membrane graft but if we are asked what is the most commonly done method which has been asked recently in one of the exams what will you tell out of these we have learned that these are the three methods but what is the most commonly used method the most commonly used method is this that is conjunctival autograft this you should know so mitomycin c conjunctival autograft amniotic membrane graft this is for large pterygium and the most commonly used method is conjunctival autograft that is cag okay so now i want to show you another image have a look at this image 
this image has not yet come in the exam but i have a feeling that it can come so will you have a look at this image and tell me if you get this image in the exam what are you going to mark it as see it is often confused by as with terry gem not just by students but also by practicing clinicians but this is actually not a terry gem see why i am saying it's not a terry gem it is not starting from the corner of this eye so is picture ko ek bar aur dekho have a look at this picture see it's starting from the corner and you see a wing like fold growing onto the surface of the cornea ye first glance mein aisa dikhta hai but actually nahi hai waisa it's not starting from this corner it is it is a mass here at the limbus you can see that the surface is irregular and you can see these feeder vessels you can see these feeder vessels no this is not a pinguicula this is see the, it is an irregular mass close to the limbus look at the surface kaise undulating and irregular hai and you see these big feeder vessels so now you will get a clue aise feeder vessels kahan pe hote hain so this is called as ossn ocular surface squamous neoplasia ossn ocular surface squamous neoplasia ocular surface squamous neoplasia so i just thought i will share this with you because it can come as an image based question theek hai to ye terigium nahi hai this is not a terigium this is an ocular surface squamous neoplasia right so how do we differentiate this by the fact that it is not starting from the corner it is a mass here there are the surface is irregular and there are also feeder vessels this is oss an ocular surface squamous neoplasia ठीक है चलो लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन दिस इज अ सिंपल क्वेश्चन बट देर आर अ कपल ऑफ थिंग्स टू बी लर्न फ्रॉम हियर अ कॉन्टेक्ट लेंस यूजर प्रेजेंस विद द फॉलोइंग क्लिनिकल पिक्चर ही हैज वॉटरिंग रेडनेस एंड फॉरेन बॉडी सेंसेशन इन द आई फॉर द पास्ट टू मंथ्स व्हाट इज द प्रोबेबल डायग्नोसिस तो चलो क्विकली बताओ मुझे हु विल टेल मी द आंसर Correct. The answer is GPC, giant papillary conjunctivitis. Right now, what is the clue in the question? Now, see, I always say that when we get a question, just me clinical kuch diya hua hai. Don't look at the image first. Try to look at the clinical whatever has been given, the case scenario that is given, and then you try to narrow down the answer and then look at the image for confirmation. Because first, jab ham image ko dekhte hai na, confusion hota hai. when there is a clinical case scenario based question read the question first you may even without looking at the image you may narrow down to the answer so see here the the key in the question is that it's a contact lens user it's a contact lens user who is presenting this with irritation foreign body sensation etc etc now this giant papillary conjunctivitis this is seen in association with anything that irritates the conjunctiva so ill fitting contact lenses is one of the causes of gpc ill fitting contact lenses it can be seen if there are protruding sutures protruding sutures so sometimes after surgeries in the eye if the sutures are not properly buried then the sutures can irritate the conjunctiva also it can be seen if you are wearing some prosthesis so with prosthesis ill fitting contact lenses protruding sutures the irritation of the conjunctiva gives rise to this kind of giant papillary conjunctiva and see you see look at these elevations they are like squarish like this now some students always ask why we have mark not mark spring catar so see spring catar or vernal conjunctivitis ke question mein hamesha they will mention that it is a boy the age of the boy will be between 5 to 15 years of age and they will say that it is a recurrent condition there is complaint of itching recurrent condition and there is complaint of itching these are the key words so ye key words honge na tabhi wo spring catar hoga they will say that it's a child who is getting recurrent itching they will mention that it happens just before the onset of summer months if all this is there then only the answer will be spring catar right and these two these are follicular conjunctivitis that is trachoma and follicular conjunctivitis which is commonly adenoviral apart from trachoma other important type of follicular conjunctivitis is trachoma is 
एडिनो वायरल कंजेंटिवाइटिस और उसका प्रेजेंटेशन ऐसे दो महीने वाला तो नहीं होगा इट विल बी अ पेशेंट हु इज गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट विथ रेडनेस वॉटरिंग अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ डिस्चार्ज स्टिकीनेस ऑफ द आईलेट्स सो उसका प्रेजेंटेशन ही अलग है सो इवन इफ वी डोंट नो दिस इमेज वी कैन स्टिल आंसर द क्वेश्चन सो ट्राई टू अप्लाई दिस रूल टू दी अदर टू अदर क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो ठीक है चलो एंड जस्ट टू शो यू वन मोर इमेज दिस इज वॉट फॉलिकल्स विल लुक लाइक सी इन दोनों पिक्चर्स में ना थोड़ा फर्क है इफ यू रियली वॉन्ट टू नो सो सी दीज आर लाइक थोड़ा सा स्क्वेरिश दीज आर मोर राउंडिश दीज आर फॉलिकल्स नाउ फॉलिकल्स दीज आर एक्चुअली कलेक्शन ऑफ लिम्फोसाइट्स सो दीज आर एग्रीगेशन ऑफ लिम्फोसाइट्स एंड सी हाउ दे लुक दे आर लाइक राउंडिश right so this is what follicles look like so follicular conjunctivitis is likely to look like this okay let's go to the next question very 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 simple question but often asked question which of the following layer maintains the dehydration and transparency of the cornea chalo quick answer which layer is responsible for maintaining the dehydration and transparency of the cornea i think everybody will know this chalo quick one second mein answer hona chahiye ye correct it is the endothelium so to quickly revise the endothelium it has the sodium potassium atpase pump and this sodium potassium atpase pump helps to maintain the cornea in a state of dehydration and that is one of the main causes for the transparency of the cornea that is one of the main causes for the transparency of the cornea now i want you to quickly revise what are the other causes of corneal transparency so one we have just read is endothelial pump so quickly tell me the other causes endothelial pump is one the next one is the regular arrangement of the stromal fibers so the regular arrangement of stromal fibers this we must know as they say like the back of our hand regular arrangement of the stromal fibers then the third cause for the transparency of the cornea is that it is avascular very good a vascularity then the fourth is that the nerve fibers in the cornea they are unmyelinated so unmyelinated nerve fibers so endothelial pump regular arrangement of the stromal fibers avascularity unmyelinated nerve fibers and the last one is the epithelium and the tear film which maintain a smooth optical surface epithelium and the tear film which maintain a smooth optical surface which maintain a smooth optical surface so this every one of us must know so इसको क्विकली मेमोराइज कर लो इफ यू हैव नॉट मेमोराइज इट ऑलरेडी दैट द इम्पॉर्टेंट कॉजेज फॉर द ट्रांसपेरेंसी ऑफ द कॉर्निया आर एंडोथीरियल पम्प रेगुलर अरेंजमेंट ऑफ स्ट्रोमल फाइबर्स ए वैस्कुलरिटी अनमेलिनेटेड नर्व फाइबर्स एंड द स्मूथ ऑप्टिकल सर्फेस दैट इज कॉज बाय द एपीथीरियम एंड द टीफ सो सी द एंडोथीरियम इट मेंटेन्स द डिहाइड्रेशन बाय द सोडियम पोटेशियम ए टी पेस पम्प ठीक है वेरी वेरी सिंपल क्वेश्चन लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट वन which of the following is a characteristic feature of a fungal corneal ulcer which of the following is a characteristic feature of a fungal corneal ulcer so chalo quickly tell me what is the answer so who will tell me what's the answer to this very very good so it is satellite lesion satellite lesions these are the this is the characteristic feature of a fungal corneal ulcer now this is also something if somebody wakes up in the middle of the night also we should be able to say the differences between a bacterial and a fungal corneal ulcer so quickly usko revise kar lo what are the differences between bacterial and fungal corneal ulcer so a bacterial corneal ulcer this tends to be more symptomatic first of all more symptomatic whereas a fungal corneal ulcer these are they tend to be less symptomatic with a fungal corneal ulcer there is there may be a preceding history of trauma with vegetative matter history of trauma with vegetative matter may be present 
okay so this is what we have to remember in the history the bacterial ulcer tends to be more symptomatic fungal is usually less symptomatic but there is a history of trauma with vegetative matter second bacterial ulcer usually is single and the margins are defined are well defined so single ulcer with well defined margins for fungal ulcer what are the points to remember they are usually multiple so there is one large ulcer and there will be satellite lesions that is smaller lesions surrounding it the margins are typically described as feathery fuzzy or ill defined please remember these words feathery fuzzy or ill defined margins and the surface is described as dry or leathery dry or leathery surface so these key words if we remember it is much it is it becomes easy for us to answer any question so satellite lesions feathery fuzzy or ill defined margins and dry and leathery surface now i am just going to show you an image and i want you to tell me i'll just name these images as image number 1 and image number 2 now if you look at image number 1 will you are you likely to call it as bacterial or fungal abhi humne ye pad liya abhi ye spotter bhi aa sakta hai so how are we going to identify isko hum kya bolenge what are we going to call this if picture number 1 ko hum kya bolenge i'll just mark out the ulcer for you ha huh? this is our ulcer ye hai ulcer apna so picture number 1 ko kya bolenge aur picture number 2 ko kya bolenge correct picture number 1 is a bacterial corneal ulcer good this is more likely to be a bacterial corneal ulcer but why why are we saying that this is a bacterial corneal ulcer because see it is a single lesion correct it is a single ulcer and look at the margins the margins are reasonably sharp we have sharp margins so single ulcer with well defined or sharp margins that's why we are calling this as a bacterial corneal and why are you saying that this number 2 is a fungal corneal ulcer why are you saying that this is a fungal corneal ulcer because see here you have this one large ulcer and then there are multiple small lesions so there is see one large ulcer like this and surrounding it there are like smaller ulcers so these are called as your satellite lesions so because of the presence of these satellite lesions that is why i am calling this as a fungal corneal so this can come as an image based question also so these are the two things you have to look for in the image if it is a fungal ulcer more often than not it will have these kind of satellite lesions that is smaller lesions which surround the main ulcer and for bacterial you will have a single lesion with very sharp or well defined margins so isko agar hum yaad rakhenge to we will be able to apply it to the image and for the theory ye points to humne padha hi but one more point that you have to remember is related to the hypopian that is the pus in the anterior chamber so see for bacterial ulcer the hypopian is is described as mobile hypopian is described as mobile meaning it is not very dense so it will move with the position of the head hypopian is mobile and sterile sterile means it contains pus cells but no bacteria whereas in case of a fungal ulcer please remember this memorize it if you have not yet memorized that the hypopian is typically described as immobile or fixed meaning it is so thick that it doesn't move with the movement of the head so immobile or fixed and it is non sterile immobile or fixed and it is non sterile meaning if you if you aspirate it you will be able to get fungal hyphae so in fungal corneal ulcer the hypopian is immobile and it is described as non sterile so mobile and sterile for bacterial and immobile and non sterile for fungal so these key words so if you get a case based question na ye key words hamesha hote hain and if you get an image based question i told you ki ye do cheeze dekhni hoti hain ki whether it is a single ulcer or there are satellite lesions and whether the margins are sharp or the margins are not theek hai to ye sabko clear hai na everybody has understood this part everybody has understood this na 
चलो आई जस्ट शो यू अ कपल ऑफ मोर इमेजेस यस नॉन स्टेराइल फॉर फंगल करेक्ट नॉन स्टेराइल मीन्स दैट फंगल हाइफी आर प्रेजेंट इन द पर्स बिकॉज द फंगाई दे ग्रो इन टू द एंटीरियर चेयर चलो अभी इस पिक्चर को देखो इफ यू गेट दिस इमेज इन द एग्जाम दिस इज वाई दिस अल्सर इज अपियरिंग टू बी ग्रीन बिकॉज इट इज स्टेन विथ फ्लूरसिन डाई बिकॉज द अल्सर इज इज नॉट इज नॉट वेरी प्रोमिनेंट दैट्स वाई यू स्टेन विथ फ्लोरसिन डाई एंड यू पुट ऑन द कोबल्ट ब्लू लाइट और द कोबल्ट ब्लू फिल्टर ऑफ द स्लिट लैम्प टू गिव अ गुड कॉन्ट्रास्ट सो हियर वॉट इज द अल्सर दैट यू सी यू सी एन अल्सर लाइक दिस सी देर इज एन अल्सर लाइक दिस and then this branching ulcer the ulcer looks something like this so what is this called this is not yet geographic it is more in the dendritic stage so it is a dendritic ulcer and where do we get to see this this is commonly seen in hsv that is herpes simplex virus it is seen in hsv keratitis that is herpes simplex virus keratitis this is a dendritic ulcer which is seen in hsv keratitis so ye picture jo hai this has come many times in the exam aur wo aur bhi aa sakta hai it is very very likely to come again also so the basic clue is that these ulcers are very very small i mean very fine so wo may not be picked up normally so that's why they are stained with fluorescein dye to aise greenish color ka ulcer hoga and background light will be blue to give a contrast and if you look at the ulcer you will see one linear ulcer aur aise branches nikle honge so this is a dendritic ulcer of hsv keratitis abhi is picture ko dekho if you get this in the exam and the question mentions that this is a contact lens user then what will you say if i say this is the ulcer and the patient is a contact lens user what is this this is typically what is this see you see this is what is called as a ring ulcer so if the patient is a contact lens user and you get this kind of a ring ulcer then what is our diagnosis correct this is acanthamoeba keratitis this is acanthamoeba keratitis acanthamoeba keratitis okay keratitis this is acanthamoeba keratitis so this is again very 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 important for you to understand so see when you look at this in this question this question is unlikely to come without a clinical history ye clinical history ke bagair nahi aayega that this is a ring ulcer which is seen in a contact lens user it will be yes and they will always mention that it is the most painful corneal ulcer because this acanthamoeba keratitis is the most excruciatingly painful corneal ulcer right now just two quick questions who will tell me what is the drug of choice for fungal corneal ulcer in india in india what is the drug of choice for fungal corneal ulcer commonly asked mcq hai ye what is the commonly what is the drug of choice for fungal corneal ulcer in india chalo let us see how many people remember this very very important question for exam fungal corneal ulcer what is the drug of choice in india in india what is the drug that we are giving very good we are giving natamycin which is given as a 5% eye drops natamycin 5% eye drops this is the drug of choice in india because in india the most common leaf fungal ulcers are caused by aspergillus and aspergillus is very very sensitive to natamycin so because the aspergillus is very sensitive to natamycin that's why drug of choice in india for fungal corneal ulcer is natamycin 5% eye drops now tell me what is the drug of choice for hsv dendritic ulcer if it is hsv dendritic ulcer what is the drug that you will give here again important question very very commonly asked here the drug that is to be given is i have already written the first what is the drug to be given drug of choice for hsv dendritic ulcer वेरी गुड इट इज असाइक्लोवीर लेकिन वो इनकम्प्लीट आंसर है असाइक्लोवीर इट इज गिवेन एज थ्री परसेंट आई ऑइनमेंट ओरल नहीं है ठीक है 
so don't make a mistake it is a cyclovir 3% i ointment that is what is given for hsv dendritic ulcer hsv dendritic ulcer so see this natamycin is coming as eye drops ye acevir jo hai it comes as eye ointment and what is the drug of choice for acanthamoeba keratitis this if you don't know please memorize it is called as phmb polyhexamethylin biguanide phmb polyhexamethylin biguanide phmb this is the drug of choice for acanthamoeba keratitis also comes as eye drops phmb polyhexamethylin biguanide ठीक है सो दीज आर लाइक मस्ट नो थिंग्स फ्रॉम दिस पार्ट एंड फंगल कॉर्नियल अल्सर और बैक्टीरियल कॉर्नियल अल्सर इनफैक्ट द होल ऑफ कैरेटाइटिस इज समथिंग दैट एज आई से वी मस्ट नो वेरी वेरी वेल उसमें से कुछ ना कुछ हमेशा ही पूछते हैं ऑलवेज इन ऑलमोस्ट एवरी एग्जाम वी विल हैव समथिंग ठीक है चलो लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन यस वॉट इज द इंडिकेशन फॉर दिस प्रोसीजर chal let's look at this what is the indication for this procedure look at this image and what are what is the indication for this procedure keratoglobus vogt's limbal girdle keratoconus or corneal dystrophies what is the indication for this procedure yes i know that all of you know this the indication is keratoconus par ye hai kya look at this ring in the cornea here these are called as intracorneal ring segments intracorneal ring segments intracorneal ring segments also called as icrs and one of the types of icrs is what you are saying that is intacs intacs this is a type of intracorneal ring segments right so now just to quickly revise a little bit about keratoconus and its treatment options because this time they have asked icrs they can ask the other things also so quickly what is keratoconus keratoconus comes under what we call as corneal ectasia right it is a corneal ectasia ectasia means what it is protrusion of the cornea which is associated with thinning protrusion of the cornea so not just protrusion there is protrusion of the cornea which is associated with thinning and it is not a protrusion of the whole cornea also it is only a protrusion of a part of the cornea so only a part of the cornea is protruded and the same part of the cornea is also thinned out so protrusion of the cornea associated with thinning now because of this protrusion of the cornea which is associated with thinning what is the problem the problem is that what is the refractive error that you see in keratoconus the refractive error associated with keratoconus is irregular myopic astigmatism again common mcq what is the refractive error associated with keratoconus so the refractive error is irregular myopic astigmatism and because of this irregular myopic astigmatism are the symptoms that is frequent change of glasses unhappy with glasses kyunki irregular astigmatism jo hai wo chashme se nahi theek kar sakte so that is why hum jo bhi chashma denge na the patient will be unhappy only wo dukhi hi rahega aur wo he keeps on changing his glasses kyunki usko lagta hai dusra chashma lenge to i will see better so this irregular myopic astigmatism is the problem in keratoconus for which the patient comes to us with change of glasses and when you do a retinoscopy for the patient what is the earliest sign you see again very 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 important mcq what is the sign seen in retinoscopy what is the sign that you see in retinoscopy i'll tell you please memorize this if you don't know it is called as scissoring of the retinoscopy reflex scissoring of the reflex or splitting of the reflex in retinoscopy this is one of the earliest signs of keratoconus ye bar bar mcq puchte hain scissoring of the retinoscopy reflex in scissoring of the reflex in retinoscopy right baki of course there are many many signs we will not discuss that but i want to discuss the treatment options so tell me what is the first line of management that you will do for keratoconus patients is patient ki problem kya hai the problem is the myopic astigmatism which is irregular and which is not getting corrected with the chashma that is the glasses so the first line of management is 
contact lens what kind of contact lens they are called as rigid gas permeable contact lenses rigid gas permeable contact lens rgp contact lens so chashme se theek nahi ho raha hai so we will try prescribing contact lenses but the problem with these contact lenses is ki if the cornea is too much protruded na uske upar lens nahi baithega it will slip so when you are not able to fit the contact lens then you do a procedure which is used to flatten the cornea so cornea ko we will make it a little flatter and then we will try to fit the lens so now who will tell me what is the name of the procedure for flattening the cornea in keratoconus what is the procedure for flattening the cornea in keratoconus correct c3r that is corneal collagen cross linking with riboflavin corneal collagen cross linking with riboflavin corneal collagen cross linking with riboflavin or c3r some people also write it as cxr now this is a procedure as i told you this is meant for flattening the cornea this is meant for flattening the cornea uske alawa what else we can do what we just learned that is icrs or intacts intracorneal ring segments right intracorneal ring segment so what are these intacts doing actually they are also trying to correct the astigmatism so this is also meant to correct the astigmatism so ye jo sare cheeze hum kar rahe hain they are all meant to correct the astigmatism so we can first try giving rgp lenses if we are not able to fit the lenses we will do c3r we also have the option of doing intracorneal ring segments or intacts and agar kuch none of these things are working na then the last option is keratoplasty keratoplasty means cornea transplantation so keratoplasty or cornea transplantation this is the last option so these are the treatment options for keratoconus isko acche se pad lo because this time they have asked intacts there is a high probability they will they may ask other things in in other exam okay chalo let's go to the next question again very very important question which of the following is false regarding retinitis pigmentosa retinal pigmentation disc pallor narrowing of the blood vessels and a normal erg so which of the following is false chalo quick answer simple question quick answer correct the answer is that the erg is normal so retinitis pigmentosa we all know that it is a dystrophy of it is a dystrophy of the rod cells right it is a dystrophy of the rod cells of the retina the rod cells of the retina and therefore the presentation of these patients is with night blindness that is nyctalopia so night blindness or nyctalopia this is the complaint of these patients and the triad of signs is this again very very common and important image that comes in the exam so jo same cheez hai yahan pe likhi hai na this triad of signs usko yahan pe hame apply karna hai so see number 1 is pale disc look at the color of the disc it is white you can hardly make out the blood vessels normally jo disc hai usme se aise blood vessels nikalte hue dikhte hain isme hardly koi blood vessel dikh raha hai so attenuation of the blood vessels attenuation of the blood vessels and the most important thing is if you look at the mid peripheral retina you will see these black black pigments so these black black pigments in the mid peripheral retina that is this retinal pigmentation this is called as your bony corpuscles or your bony spicules so this is your bony corpuscles or your bony spicules that is these black black pigments due to hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the rpe so this is seen where this is seen in the mid peripheral retina so all this is correct so you can get this as an image based question also but what is wrong is this that the erg is normal the erg in a case of retinitis pigmentosa it is not normal now the erg or the electro retinogram this is the investigation of choice right this is the investigation of choice so what are the waves in the normal erg normal erg aisa dikhta hai so there is a down wave which is called as the a wave and there is an up wave which is called as the b wave so in a normal erg this down wave or this a wave it arises from the photoreceptor cells and 
this b wave it arises from the bipolar and the muller cells so in case of retinitis pigmentosa where the photoreceptor rod cells are affected this a wave will be affected so what will happen to the a wave in e in retinitis pigmentosa in retinitis pigmentosa you will see that there is a decrease in the amplitude of the a wave there is a decrease in the amplitude of the a wave Okay, so the ERG is going to be abnormal. So there is a decrease in the amplitude of this A wave in retinitis pigmentosa. So that is why this is abnormal. So that's why this is this is what is wrong, right? Now retinitis pigmentosa, unfortunately, it is a very very disappointing disease for both the clinician and the patient because the not really too much can be done for this patient. But there is one retinal prosthesis which is being used for the treatment of retinitis pigmentosa. Will you be able to tell me what is the name of that retinal prosthesis? I just thought I'll share this with you. Will you be able to see what is the name or say what is the name of this prosthesis? Anybody knows? Just learn it up. The name of this prosthesis is Argus 2. Argus 2 retinal prosthesis. Okay, Argus 2 retinal prosthesis. Okay, so otherwise in retinitis pigmentosa, most of the treatment that we give that is going to be supportive treatment only. So vitamin A is given, then low vision aids are given, magnifying glasses, all these are supportive treatment. So this is one type of Argus 2 retinal prosthesis. This is used, this is being used in the treatment of retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, so if you have any questions, please keep putting it up here. Chal, look at this question. A 60-year-old patient with progressive painless loss of vision presents to the ophthalopedy and this is the fundus picture. What could be the probable finding and cause? Now this is completely an image based question so that's why here we have to look at the image otherwise I, I keep telling you na, that don't look at the image, read the question but here what will be our answer? Chalo, I'll wait for some a few people to answer and then I'll tell you why this is the answer and why if, and how to look at similar images. Yeah, so a couple of you have answered. Correct. So these are hard exudates in diabetic retinopathy. In sorry, yes, in diabetes mellitus, that is diabetic retinopathy. Now see, there are a few, there are a couple of other images that I will show you. Now, the image that you can easily exclude out of these four, the option that you can easily exclude is this, right? That is CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion, ye nahi ho sakta because central retinal vein occlusion looks like this. So see, this is CRVO. Why we are calling this as CRVO? Because the whole fundus is full of hemorrhages. That is, this is typically what we call as our splashed tomato appearance. Right? So, this is the typical splashed tomato appearance in CRVO. So, ye jo option hai, ye easily excluded hai. So, whole fundus is full of hemorrhages, red red patches humko dikh rahe hai. So, we are saying this as, this is, this is CRVO. So, fir, jab hume exam mein options milenge, so, ye CRVO to nahi hai, itna to we can easily say. But there is a confusion with the first two options, right? Why we are not saying these are soft exudates and why we are not saying they are flame-shaped hemorrhages. Now, ye jo question hai, look at this picture. Is picture ko dekho and look at this hemorrhage here. Look at this hemorrhage. What is the shape of this hemorrhage? The shape of this hemorrhage is like this. It is an elongated kind of hemorrhage. Right? Ye jo hai na, isko hum bolte hai flame shaped hemorrhage. We call this as flame, these are your flame shaped hemorrhage. Okay? And ye jo small yellow yellow dots hai, here that you see, these are your small yellow yellow dots. And here also you see that there are small yellow yellow dots. These small yellow yellow dots, they are your, they are called as hard exudates. But if you have these large yellow dots, ye jo large yellow dots hai, these are what you call as cotton wool spots. These large yellow dots, they are called as your cotton wool spots or the old name for this was soft exudates. 
सो जो स्मॉल येलो येलो एरियाज होते हैं ना दे आर मोर लाइकली टू बी हार्ड एक्सुलेट्स वेर एज द लार्ज वाइटिश एरियाज आर लाइकली टू बी कॉटन वूल स्पॉट दे आर नॉट लाइकली टू बी हार्ड एक्सुलेट्स and look at this hemorrhage this if you have an elongated hemorrhage that is a flame shaped hemorrhage now flame shaped hemorrhages are more commonly seen in hypertension lekin diabetes mein jo hemorrhage hai look at this look at this hemorrhage here ye hai yahan pe hemorrhage so what are these hemorrhages these are dot hemorrhages dot hemorrhages so these kind of dot blot hemorrhages dot blot hemorrhages they are more common in diabetes so in this picture what we are seeing is we are seeing some hard exudates and we are seeing some dot blot hemorrhages so that is why we are make, marking diabetes as our answer so that is why this is the answer okay so if you see hard exudates with these kind of dot hemorrhages it is more likely to be diabetes but if you see it with these kind of elongated hemorrhages it is more likely to be hypertension so this is what you have to look for if you get an image based question kyunki sab me sab hota hai diabetes me bhi hemorrhage hard exudate cotton wool spots hota hai hypertension me bhi hota hai hemorrhage hard exudate cotton wool spots so agar if it is a purely image based question then how do you differentiate look at the type of the hemorrhage if the hemorrhages are elongated or flame shaped it is more likely to be hypertension but if the hemorrhages are like this small small dots then it is more likely to be diabetes okay so therefore the answer is hard exudates in diabetes so see this is what is what we call as diabetic maculopathy or we call it as csme clinically significant macular edema right so this is what is called as csme that is clinically significant macular edema in diabetes in diabetic retinopathy or in diabetes mellitus so now who will tell me what are the treatment options this is something we should know what are the treatment options for csme again important so Swe swelling of retina due to loss of vision in diabetic patient is csme only the it is macular edema that is edema of the macula and very close to the center of the macula so that is called as csme so swelling of the retina so tell me what is the treatment ye this also something we have to know very very well chalo tell me no it is not prp the treatment for csme is grid photocoagulation not pan retinal photocoagulation grid photocoagulation theek hai grid photocoagulation and the other option is as you are saying intravitreal steroids or intravitreal anti vegf injection intravitreal steroid or intravitreal anti vegf injection so for this clinically significant macular edema the treatment options are grid photocoagulation and and intravitreal steroid or intravitreal anti vegf injections okay now i'll show you the next question then you will realize where you went wrong look at this question here a diabetic person presents to us with a visual acuity of 6 by 9 now investigation revealed pre retinal hemorrhage and neovascularization at the optic disc what is the next step in the management now tell me iska answer kya hoga now what is answer for this now what is the answer here Hello I'll just wait for a couple of minutes for somebody to answer before I tell you Correct iska answer pan retinal photocoagulation hai the answer to this is pan retinal photocoagulation why because see pre retinal hemorrhages and neovascularization this is suggestive of proliferative diabetic retinopathy so this is proliferative diabetic retinopathy जो हमने प्रीवियस क्वेश्चन में देखा दैट वाज क्लिनिकली सिग्निफिकेंट मैक्यूलर एडिमा और डायबिटिक मैक्यूलोपैथी सो सी आई जस्ट गो बैक टू दिस वंस मोर फॉर डायबिटिक मैक्यूलोपैथी द लेजर प्रोसीजर टू बी डन इज ग्रिड फोटोकोआगुलेशन अलोंग विद दैट यू कैन गिव इंट्रावेचुअल स्टीरॉइड्स और इंट्रावेचुअल एंटी वीजीएफ इंजेक्शन 
but if it is a proliferative diabetic retinopathy as is mentioned here that there are pre-retinal hemorrhages and there is new vascularization then the treatment is PRP pan retinal photocoagulation for this the treatment options are PRP pan retinal photocoagulation and of course intravitreal anti-VEGF injections intravitreal anti-VEGF injections. Intravitreal anti-VEGF injection is there but this laser procedure is called as PRP, pan-retinal photocoagulation. Like in previous question may, it was not proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It was CSME, clinically significant macular edema or diabetic maculopathy. Pooch mein jo laser hai, usko bolte hai, grid laser photocoagulation. Theek hai? Is this clear to everyone? I hope you will not make a mistake with this now. Treatment option for PDR and treatment option for CSME are not the same. Sabko samaj aaya ye? Okay, now if I ask you that what is the treatment for NPDR, if I say that it is non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, if this, if we say that it, the treat, the patient is having non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, then what is the treatment? For this stage, there is no ocular treatment. The treatment here is glycemic and metabolic control. Glycemic and metabolic control is the treatment. So here the treatment is going to be only glycemic and metabolic control. Here we are not going to do any kind of ocular management. So I will just repeat this once more. For NPDR, no ocular treatment, only glycemic and metabolic control. For PDR, that is proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the treatment is pan-retinal photocoagulation and intravitreal anti-VEGF injection. And for diabetic maculopathy or clinically significant macular edema, it is laser but this laser is called grid photocoagulation along with that intravitreal steroid or intravitreal anti-VGF injection. Please memorize this very very well because you ghoom pirke yahi se hi kuch na kuch pooch the exam. Chal, let's go to the next question. Chal, very very simple. Shifting fluid is a sign of, is a feature of. Very, very simple question, but I just put this up because I wanted to discuss a couple of other things actually. Very simple questions, but I wanted to discuss the treatment options because that's why I, I thought that we'll discuss this question. Correct. All of you know that the answer to this is exudative retinal detachment. Right. Now, we know that there are three types of RD, regmatogenous, tractional and exudative. Now, I'll just quickly revise this because this time exudative, recently exudative is asked, so the rest of them can be asked. So, quickly, which is the commonest variety out of these, by the way? The commonest variety is regmatogenous. It is most common. Now, regmatogenous retinal detachment, regmatogenous RD, it is, it is what are the risk factors or what are the causes? The risk factors are high myopes. It is seen in high myopia. It can be associated with trauma and it may be associated with aphakia. So high myopia, trauma, aphakia, right? So this is regmatogenous RD. And what is the typical symptom? Who is going to tell me what is the typical symptom? What is the typical symptom? Regmatogenous RD means that it is associated with retinal tear. Correct. That is the, the, this is associated with retinal tear. And what is the typical symptom of regmatogenous RD? The typical symptom is curtain-like vision loss. A curtain-like vision loss or a curtain moving in front of the eyes. Vision loss which is described like a curtain. Curtain-like vision loss. And this retina here, you are going to see that this retina is convex. The detached retina is convex, but it is corrugated, meaning it will have folds. It is going to be convex, it is corrugated and there will be a retinal break. Correct, veil in front of the eyes or curtain in front of the eyes. Ye jo key words hai na, I am repeating them again and again because isi ko yaad rakhna hai humko. So, regmatogenous RD, it means it is associated with retinal tear, risk factors, high myopia, trauma, aphakia. Symptom is curtain-like vision loss. 
इट इज कन्वेक्स मतलब जो रेटिना है वो आगे दिखेगा लाइक दिस द रेटिना इज कॉन्वेक्स बट इट इज कॉरुगेटेड सो यू विल सी फोल्ड ऑन द रेटिना एंड यू विल सी अ रेटिनल ब्रेक मतलब देर विल बी अ टीयर एंड वॉट इज द सर्जरी ऑफ चॉइस फॉर रेगमेटोजनस आर डी येस कर्टन लाइक विजन लॉस विच मे बी प्रिसीडेड बाय फ्लैशेज एंड फ्लोटर्स गुड वेरी गुड शिवम सो कर्टन लाइक विजन लॉस विच मे बी प्रिसीडेड बाय फ्लैशेज एंड फ्लोटर्स करेक्ट and who will tell me what is the surgery of choice हमको यहाँ पे क्या याद रखना है इफ वी आर आस्ट वॉट इज द सर्जरी ऑफ चॉइस फॉर एग आर डी द नेम ऑफ द सर्जरी इज स्लेरल बकलिंग सर्जरी द नेम ऑफ द सर्जरी इज स्लेरल बकलिंग सर्जरी सो स्लेरल बकलिंग सर्जरी दिस इज द सर्जरी ऑफ चॉइस फॉर एग मैटोजनस आर डी ओके सो इतना जो है रेग आर डी के बारे में याद रखना है नेक्स्ट ट्रैक्शनल आर डी ट्रैक्शनल आर डी मीन्स इट इज बिकॉज ऑफ ट्रैक्शन और पुल एक्सर्टेड ऑन द रेटिना ना दिस इज असोसिएटेड विथ डिजॉर्डर्स लाइक प्रोलिफरेटिव डायबिटिक रेटनोपैथी दैट इज पी डी आर प्रोलिफरेटिव डायबिटिक रेटनोपैथी इट मे बी सीन इन केसेस ऑफ वीनस ऑक्लूशंस इट कैन बी सीन इन वीनस ऑक्लूशंस विच गिव राइज टू लॉन्ग स्टैंडिंग विट्रिस हेमरेज सो रेटिनल वीनस ऑक्लूशंस venous occlusion in the retina it they may be associated with eels disease and another important cause is rop retinopathy of prematurity so proliferative diabetic retinopathy venous occlusions eels disease and rop right now here please remember that the retina here is concave so the retina is like this it doesn't it is not like this the retina is concave concave configuration concave configuration of the retina and what is the treatment again it is surgical but the name of this surgery is pars plana vitrectomy pars plana vitrectomy so see regardi me i told you the name of the surgery you have to learn is scleral buckling surgery and for tractional rd the name of the surgery is pars plana vitrectomy okay last one is exudative rd now for exudative rd what are the causes exudative rd commonly is associated with choroiditis it may be seen in choroidal tumors choroiditis choroidal tumors and it may also be associated with posterior scleritis posterior scleritis these are the important causes and here also the retina is convex just like you saw in reg rd but it is smooth so remember these two words so exudative rd mein convex and smooth reg rd mein what did i told you convex but corrugated and it is associated with retinal break for exudative rd remember convex smooth and what we just learned that is shifting fluid convex smooth and shifting fluid okay and tractional may i told you it is concave and what is the treatment treatment of exudative rd is treatment of the cause but most of them are usually usually they are inflammatory causes so in most of the times exudative rd is treated with systemic steroids so it is actually treatment of the cause but most of the causes are inflammatory causes like see choroiditis posterior scleritis so most of them are inflammatory causes so they are usually treated with systemic steroids okay so this is again something a small topic which i thought that we have to do very very well chalo let's go to the next question what is the most commonly used regimen for the treatment of retinoblastoma what is the most commonly used regimen for the treatment of retinoblastoma who will tell me the answer most commonly used regimen for the treatment of retinoblastoma is yes d remember this vin christine carboplatin and etoposide vin christine carboplatin and etoposide this is the most commonly used regimen for the treatment of retinoblastoma 
right now in retinoblastoma now quickly what i will do is i will just quickly tell you the treatment protocol see you get three types of questions from retinoblastoma so here we have they have given us the drugs so sometimes the question is a clinical case so we get three types of questions for retinoblastoma the first set of questions is where the question is on intraocular rb intraocular retinoblastoma that is retinoblastoma which is confined to the globe the second set of questions is where you have retinoblastoma with orbital extension so the question says that there is retinoblastoma and it has spread to the orbit and the third set of questions are where they say that there is retinoblastoma with mets with metastasis ठीक है ये थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ क्वेश्चंस यहाँ पे आते हैं इंट्रा ऑक्यूलर आर बी आर बी विथ ऑर्बिटल एक्सटेंशन एंड द थर्ड इज वेन यू वेन दे आस्क अ क्वेश्चन ऑन आर बी विथ मेट्स अभी आर बी विथ मेट्स का तो ऑब्वियसली आंसर सबसे सिंपल है द आंसर इज पैलिएटिव केमोथेरेपी ये क्वेश्चन अगर आ गया तो ये वेरी वेरी सिंपल क्वेश्चन द आंसर इज पैलिएटिव केमोथेरेपी ये आता है बट लेस कॉमन सो नाउ इंट्रा ऑक्यूलर और ये सेकेंड वाला हमको याद करना है सो इंट्रा ऑक्यूलर रेटिनोब्लास्टोमा में अगेन इसको दो ग्रुप्स में ब्रॉडली डिवाइड कर सकते हैं इफ द मास इज लार्ज और द मास इज स्मॉल सो इफ यू हैव अ लार्ज मास विच इज ऑक्यूपाइंग मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द ग्लोब इफ इट्स अ लार्ज मास ऑक्यूपाइंग मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द ग्लोब देन द ट्रीटमेंट इज ई न्यूक्लिएशन वॉट डू वी मीन माई ई न्यूक्लिएशन ई न्यूक्लिएशन मीन्स रिमूवल ऑफ द ग्लोब विद अ पोर्शन ऑफ द ऑप्टिक नर्व so not just removal of the globe ah removal of the globe with a portion of the optic nerve this is e nucleation and if it is intraocular but less than 50% of the globe that is if it is a small mass then what do you do is then the treatment is you don't remove the globe but you just treat the mass and that is called as focal therapy that is called as focal therapy you treat the mass but not do not remove the globe so what are the options of focal therapy available the options of focal therapy available are laser cryotherapy and brachytherapy laser cryotherapy and brachytherapy these are the options of focal therapy that are available so dekho ye question aayega agar intraocular pe question aayega to dekhna hai ki whether they have said it's a large mass or a small mass if it's a large mass more than 50% you mark enucleation as the answer if it is a small mass you mark focal therapy as the answer ठीक है नाउ नेक्स्ट इज इफ द क्वेश्चन इज ऑन आर बी विथ ऑर्बिटल एक्सटेंशन इफ इट एक्सटेंड्स टू द ऑर्बिट लोकली एडवांस्ड में द ट्रीटमेंट बिगिन विथ केमोथेरेपी देन वी गो फॉर ई न्यूक्लिएशन एंड देन यू गो फॉर ऑर्बिटल रेडियोथेरेपी तो केमोथेरेपी ई न्यूक्लिएशन एंड ऑर्बिटल रेडियोथेरेपी दिस इज द ट्रीटमेंट फॉर आर बी विथ ऑर्बिटल एक्सटेंशन सो ये चार्ट भी ना एक बेसिक फ्लो चार्ट है जिसको हमको याद करना है बिकॉज दे कम एज क्लिनिकल केस बेस्ड क्वेश्चन सो दिस इज दिस इज अगेन अनदर स्मॉल थिंग दैट आई वॉन्टेड टू डिस्कस विथ सो टेल मी ये सबको समझ आया क्या हैज एवरी वन अंडरस्टूड दिस एवरी वन हैज अंडरस्टूड दिस ना सो आई एम गोइंग टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन सी अ चाइल्ड प्रेजेंट विथ अ वाइट प्यूपुलरी रिफ्लेक्स फॉर विच इन्यूक्लेशन इज डन and the examination shows the presence of this flexner winter steiner rosent now this flexner winter steiner rosent is obviously the dead giveaway that the child has presented with e has presented with leukocoria that is white pupillary reflex which is the most common presentation for yes it is the most common presentation for retinoblast so real they really there is nothing more to discuss in this just remember fw rosets that is flexner winter steiner i'll finish one more question we have about 28 questions in all i'll finish one more questions and then we'll take a short break look at this a physician observed the following finding in a child who came for an eye examination now this finding is associated with which of the following conditions myopia astigmatism hypermetropia or emetro so what do you see here you see that the eye is is inwards right so it's a convergent squint or esotropia so it's a convergent squint or esotropia in this left eye 
कन्वर्जन स्क्विंट विच इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज ईसोट्रोपिया कन्वर्जन स्क्विंट और ईजोट्रोपिया राइट Yes. So convergent squint or esotropia in children is a result of uncorrected hypermetropia. And what is the name of this hypermetropia? So uncorrected hypermetropia in children is associated with esotropia. And what is this esotropia called? Esotropia associated with uncorrected hypermetropia in children. This is called as accommodative esotropia. It is called as accommodative esotropia. it is called as accommodative esotropia so accommodative esotropia because there is excessive accommodation in hypermetropic children if the hypermetropia is uncorrected it is associated with uncorrected hypermetropia uncorrected hypermetropic children tend to accommodate a lot and because of this there is esotropia so this is called as accommodative esotropia and this sub variety this is called as refractive there are two varieties to this there is called as there is something called as refractive variety and there is also something called as the non refractive variety right now this refractive variety what will be the treatment where the hypermetropia is giving rise to this and there is too much of accommodation because of this uncorrected hypermetropia the treatment for this is obviously glasses the treatment for this is glasses okay so this is a picture of accommodative esotropia and the treatment if it is the refractive variety then it is glasses okay refractive variety means that because there is high hypermetropia refractive variety means that high hypermetropia high hypermetropia as a result of which there is too much of accommodation and because there is too much of accommodation there is convergence now there is also another variety which is called as the non refractive variety now in the non refractive variety what happens is there is a hypermetropia but the hypermetropia is not very high so there will be some amount of hypermetropia but there is what is called as high ac by a ratio ac by a stands for accommodative convergence by accommodation so in non refractive variety there is a hypermetropia it is not exactly non refractive usme bhi refractive error hai it is associated with hypermetropia but this hypermetropia is not is not the only cause there is a high ac by a ratio ac by a ratio means accommodative convergence by accommodation now in this variety na only glasses will not suffice suffice isme bhi chashma to dena hi hai because it is because of hypermetropia but isme sometimes what is prescribed is myotics and also sometimes you may need surgery so for the non refractive variety glasses myotics and sometimes surgical management may also be needed so see uncorrected hypermetropia in children gives rise to accommodative eso accommodative eso means that it can be either refractive which means that there is a high hypermetropia which is uncorrected and here the treatment is only glasses but sometimes there is another variety called non refractive where there is a hypermetropia but it will be low to moderate it's a low to moderate hypermetropia but there is a high ac by a ratio ac by a means accommodative convergence by accommodation so here the treatment is glasses myotics and surgery ab ye pad liya humne abhi look at the next question look at this what is false regarding accommodative esotropia iske baad hum break lenge it is the most common type of squint myotics are used in patients with high ac by a ratio it is associated with high myopia and refractive type can be fully corrected by the use of spectacles so what is the answer to this question Hello quickly tell me what is the answer to this question correct so see it's most common type of squint refractive variety ke liye glasses non refractive variety that is high ac by a ratio means it is this non refractive variety and i told you for this myotics are given so all this is correct so what is wrong is this that it is associated with high myopia it is not associated with myopia it is associated with uncorrected hypermetropia 
so uncorrected hypermetropia in children gives rise to ezo okay so who will tell me that uncorrected myopic children ko kaun sa squint hota hai uncorrected myopic children they tend to develop what kind of squint uncorrected myopic children ko kaun sa squint hota hai kaun batayega uncorrected myopic children are associated with what kind of squint ulta hi hai na so uncorrected hypermetropic children if they are associated with esotropia uncorrected myopic children yes they will be associated with exo they are associated with exo that is divergent squint so divergent squint is more common in uncorrected myopic children and ezo that is convergent squint is more co more common in uncorrected hypermetropic okay so let's do something let's take a short break of 15 minutes we have finished 15 questions we have another 14 questions to go there are like about 29 questions in all 29 and 30 questions so we'll take a short break and when we come back we'll do the rest so we'll come back in 15 minutes
Hi, everyone. So please let me know. Hi, everyone. Please let me know if I'm audible and visible and we should continue. Are we good to start again? Please give me a thumbs up. Yeah, okay. So see, this is the next, uh, next question. That is, um, what is the test that is being shown here? What is the test that we are seeing here? Correct. It is the cover uncover test. Correct. So the name of this test is cover uncover test. So where exactly do we do cover uncover test? Cover uncover test. This is done. Please remember it is done for four year. That is latent squint. So this is a test for four year or latent squint. So see when you cover one of the eyes. So if the patient gives me a history of a squint, but I am not able to see that squint manifest. That's called as a latent squint or a foria. And when you cover the eye, then under the cover, you can see that this eye is deviating. But the moment you uncover, you see that the eye moves back and takes fixation once again. So in the first picture, see the eye is moving inward. So we are calling it as esophoria. And in the second one, it is moving outward. So we are calling it as exophoria. So the test for foria, that is latent squint, is cover uncover test. Now, who will tell me what is the test for manifest squint, that is tropia? Again, important question. What is the test for manifest squint or tropia? Manifest squint, which is also called as tropia. What is the name of the test for this? The name of the test for this is Hirschberg test. So please remember this also. So for manifest squint or tropia, the name of the test that you will do is Hirschberg test. So Hirschberg test for tropia and cover uncover test. This is for foria, that is for latent squint. Abhi jo next question hum karne wale hai na, this question is also this is also a test for foria. But look at this, this instrument, what is the name of this instrument? This is also used for the evaluating four years. This is also used for evaluating four years. So who will tell me what is the name of this? Yes, PDF will be made available to you. What is the name of this instrument? Chalo, quickly batao. What is the name of this instrument? PDF will be made available to you. PDF milega. Correct. The this is Medox rod. This is a Medox rod. Or uske paas ye jo hai, ye aur chota sa. This is a Medox rod. Right. Now I just want to discuss this. That is, what is the interpretation of the Medox rod? Now see, ye jo hai, this is a medox rod which is kept in front of the right eye of the patient. This is also used to detect subtle foreas. Subtle foreas. And this is the left eye. Abhi, when you put the medox rod in front of the patient's eye, or hum jab usko torch dikhayenge na, so instead of the yellow dot of the torch, that he, what he will see with the right eye, where the medox rod is kept, is a red line. Now see here, what we have used is we have used a horizontal medox rod. So, ye jo horizontal medox rod hai, it consists of a number of horizontal cylinders like this. So, multiple horizontal cylinders are kept like this. Okay. So, this is a horizontal medox rod. Now, this depends on this is going to show us what kind of foria the patient has. So, suppose this yellow dot is at the center of this red line. So, we will ask the patient what is the so, if the yellow dot is at the center of the red line, that means that patient ko koi bhi foria nahi hai. This is orthophoria. This means that there is orthophoria. But agar patient ko yellow dot or red line alag alag dikh rahe. So, he is seeing a yellow dot and a red line which are separate. 
दैट मीन्स देर इज अ फोरिया तो मतलब इसमें भी फोरिया है और इसमें भी फोरिया है नाउ सी दिस इज वॉट द पेशेंट इज सींग तो पेशेंट के हिसाब से ये राइट right साइड है और ये लेफ्ट साइड है ठीक है सो दिस इज राइट एंड दिस इज लेफ्ट अकॉर्डिंग टू द पेशेंट अब देखो इन दिस पिक्चर इफ आई नेम दिस इज पिक्चर नंबर वन जो येल्लो डॉट है वो राइट right साइड पे है और जो रेड लाइन है वो लेफ्ट साइड पे है राइट सो दिस मीन्स दैट दिस रेड लाइन इज एक्चुअली द इमेज ऑफ द राइट आई द रेड लाइन इज द इमेज ऑफ द राइट आई बट इट इज बींग सीन ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड सो दिस मीन्स दैट द इमेजेस हैव क्रॉस्ड सो देर इज अ क्रॉसिंग सो अगर वो क्रॉस्ड है बिकॉज पेशेंट के हिसाब से दिस इज राइट एंड दिस इज लेफ्ट और ये जो रेड लाइन है ना विच इज द इमेज ऑफ द राइट आई इज बींग सीन ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड विच मीन्स दैट द इमेजेस हैव क्रॉस्ड सो इफ द इमेजेस हैव क्रॉस्ड दिस मीन्स दैट इट इज एग्जो इसको याद कैसे रखेंगे देखो एग्जो के बीच में एक क्रॉस है सो बिकॉज देर इज अ क्रॉस सो दिस मीन्स इफ द इमेजेस हैव क्रॉस्ड इट इज एग्जो फॉर या और यहाँ पे देखो द इमेजेस हैव नॉट क्रॉस्ड द रेड लाइन इज ऑन द राइट साइड एंड द येल्लो डॉट इज ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड so here there is no crossing so it is uncrossed so uncrossed matlab what is the foria chalo this will tell us if everybody is attentive or not agar crossed hai to exo hai to agar uncrossed hai to crossed hai to exo hai that means uncrossed hai to kya hai what is what is it if it is uncrossed if it is crossed it is exo so if it is uncrossed what it is If it is uncrossed, obviously it is going to be ezo, ezophoria. Okay, so crossed means exophoria and uncrossed means ezophoria. Ezophoria. Okay, so this is about the horizontal phoria. So, एक बार quickly revise कर देती हूँ that if the yellow dot is at the center of the red line, that means orthophoria. मतलब there is no squint. बट अगर अलग अलग दिख रहे हैं दैट मीन्स देर इज अ फोरिया अब इस पे इट डिपेंड्स ऑन वेदर द इमेजेस हैव क्रॉस्ड और नॉट इफ द इमेजेस हैव क्रॉस्ड दैट मीन्स इट इज एक्सो एंड इफ द इमेजेस हैव नॉट क्रॉस्ड दैट मीन्स इट इज ईजो ये जो है दिस इज फॉर हॉरिजोंटल फोरियर्स दिस इज फॉर हॉरिजोंटल फोरियर्स नाउ द सेम थिंग फॉर द हॉरिजोंटल फोरियर्स आई विल यूज अ हॉरिजोंटल मेडॉक्सरॉड For vertical fourriers, you have to use a vertical medox rod. That is, a medox rod will be like this. Now here also see this red line and the yellow dot. If they are like this, that means there is no squint. In this, this is ortho fourrier. Or if they are separated, that means that there is a squint. Abhi kaise pata chalega what is the squint? The rule is if the image is up, that means the eye is down. If the image is up, that means the eye is down. so if image is up i is down ka kya matlab hai here see the right eye image is up that means the right eye is down this is the image of the right eye that is the red line that is the image of the right eye it is up that means that i is down so this means that the right eye is down that is right eye hypophoria hypophoria means that the right eye is down and isme dekho the right eye image is down that means obviously the eye is up so this means that right eye hyperphoria right eye hyperphoria so the eye is up okay so this is about our vertical squints so here in this picture in picture number 1 the right eye is up the the right eye image is up that is the red line is up that means the right eye is down so right eye hypophoria in the second one the right eye image is down which means that the right eye is up that is hyperphoria or horizontal ke liye kya humne padha that if the image is cross that means that it is exo so right eye exophoria because the images have crossed and if the images have not crossed then that is esophoria so this is the patient's view remember patient's view okay so tell me is this clear to everyone have you understood this have you understood this that how to interpret medox rod test for horizontal and vertical fourriers 
शेल वी गो टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन चले क्या नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन पे hyperen hypo see if the image is up na the eye is down so see here the right eye image is up this red line is up na so that means the right eye image is up that means that the right eye is down so the right eye image is up so right eye is down in this see in the picture number 2 the right eye image is down so that's why the right eye is up hyperfo theek hai chalo let's go to the next question A forty-year-old diabetic patient presented with squint. On examination, the secondary deviation is more than the primary deviation, and the force duction test is negative. Which of the following squint is most probable? So, what will you say? What is the answer? What is the answer? Then I will explain a couple of things, important things to be remembered from here. ओके सी सो यहाँ पे वी हैव टू रिमेंबर दैट देर आर टू ब्रॉड क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ स्क्विंट दैट इज कॉन कॉमिटेंट एंड इन कॉमिटेंट इसका आंसर तुम लोगों को पता होगा बट अ कपल ऑफ थिंग्स जो यहाँ से सीख लो क्योंकि ये क्वेश्चन ये टॉपिक फिर से रिपीट हो सकता है सो द टू ब्रॉड क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ स्क्विंट आर कॉन कॉमिटेंट स्क्विंट एंड इन कॉमिटेंट स्क्विंट ठीक है अब कॉनकॉमिटेंट और इनकॉमिटेंट का मतलब क्या है कॉनकॉमिटेंट मींस दैट द डीविएशन इज द सेम इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस द डीविएशन इज सेम इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस मतलब अगर प्राइमरी पोजीशन में 30 डिग्री डीविएशन है पेशेंट कहीं भी देखेगा तो 30 डिग्री ही रहेगा डीविएशन सो द डीविएशन इज द सेम इन ऑल डायरेक्शन राइट दिस इज कॉनकॉमिटेंट स्क्विंट एंड इनकॉमिटेंट स्क्विंट मीन्स दैट द डीविएशन is not the same in all directions so the deviation that is the degree is variable is variable that is incommitant squint now concomitant squint ke andar kaun sa aata hai concomitant squint ke andar mainly you will have the childhood squints jo humne abhi padha na accommodative esotropia the childhood squints like accommodative esotropia for example accommodative esotropia this is an example of a concomitant squint and what all comes under your incommitant squints incommitant squint ke under we have the restrictive and the paralytic squints the restrictive and the paralytic squints they come under the incommitant squints okay so this is the broad classification that you should know that concomitant means the deviation is the same in all directions and incommitant means that the degree of deviation is variable another thing here is under concomitant squint the question will always mention that the secondary deviation and the primary deviations are equal the s is greater than p this is seen in your in your childhood that is the concomitant squints okay now in paralytic squints here you will see that the s is greater than the p this you will see in case of paralytic squints in paralytic squint the secondary deviation is more than the primary deviation and another thing that is given here is that the forced duction test is negative now forced duction test is positive in case of restrictive squint so ye dono cheeze yaad kar lo so these are the pointers in the question which tell us that they are actually talking about what kind of squint that is paralytic squint सो कॉनकॉमिटेंट स्क्विंट में क्या हम याद रखेंगे टू पॉइंट्स द डिविएशन इज द सेम इन ऑल डायरेक्शन एंड द सेकेंडरी डिविएशन एंड द प्राइमरी डिविएशन विल बी इक्वल एस इज इक्वल टू पी इनकॉमिटेंट स्क्विंट में क्या याद रखेंगे इनकॉमिटेंट स्क्विंट कैन बी रिस्ट्रिक्टिव एंड पैरालाइटिक एंड द डिग्री ऑफ डिविएशन इज वेरिएबल पैरालाइटिक में याद रखेंगे द सेकेंडरी डिविएशन इज मोर देन द प्राइमरी डिविएशन और रिस्ट्रिक्टिव में याद रखेंगे दैट द फोर्स डक्शन टेस्ट दैट इज एफ डी टी इज गोइंग टू बी पॉजिटिव एंड अनदर पॉइंटर इन द क्वेश्चन इज दैट दे हैव सेड दैट इट इज अ डायबिटिक पेशेंट नाउ ये जो पैरालाइटिक स्क्विंट्स है दे आर कॉमनली सीन इन डायबिटिक्स जो पैरालाइटिक स्क्विंट्स है दे आर कॉमनली सीन इन डायबिटिक पेशेंट्स तो दैट इज ऑल्सो अनदर पॉइंटर दैट वी हैव राइट सो दिस इज अबाउट दिस क्वेश्चन Chalo, let's go to the next one. Very very simple question. 
A two-month old infant was brought by his mother with complaint of inability to open the eyes in bright light and excessive watering. So see what are the complaint? Photophobia and lacrimation. So photophobia and lacrimation, these are the complaints. And we have this, this clinical picture. So what do we see? We see a large eyeball and hazy cornea. Right? Large eyeball and hazy cornea. So what is the diagnosis here? Very, very simple question. Correct. So this is typically what we call as bufthalmus. So large eyeball, large diameter cornea and hazy cornea appearing almost blue. So this is diagnosis is congenital glaucoma. Right? Now taking the opportunity, ye to bahut hi obvious hai. there is nothing really to explain in this. But taking the opportunity of this question, I just want to tell you one more thing to you. That is what are the causes of hazy cornea in a newborn? What are the causes of hazy cornea in a newborn? Now the causes of hazy cornea in a newborn, ek to humne abhi pada, that is congenital glaucoma. This one we have already read, that is congenital glaucoma. The other causes of hazy cornea in a newborn, na? we remember this by this mnemonic, that is stumped. We remember it by this mnemonic stumped. So, here S stands for sclerocornea, that is a congenital condition where the cornea is white like the sclera. T stands for birth trauma, which happens sometimes with forceps delivery. U stands for corneal ulcer. M stands for mucopolysaccharidosis. So, M stands for mucopolysaccharidosis. P stands for a congenital anomaly where the patient has a corneal opacity. This is called as Peters anomaly. E stands for a group of disorders called as endothelial dystrophies. Endothelial dystrophy. And D stands for dermoid. Dermoid arising from the limbus. Dermoid which arises from the limbus. So, these are the other causes of hazy cornea in a newborn apart from congenital glaucoma. Isko bhi yaad kar lo. So, the, here see we have hazy cornea but this is very obvious that there is photophobia lacrimation complaint is there and you have this picture and you see large eyeball, large diameter cornea, bluish appearance. So, we know that it's congenital glaucoma but these are the other causes where a child may be born with a hazy cornea. So, apart from congenital glaucoma, remember this stump classification. Okay, Chalo. let's go to the next one. Hmm. This is also actually a question from FMG, but it's a good clinical question. So I just thought we'll discuss it. A 60 year old woman presents with sudden onset pain and redness in the eye. There is associated headache, nausea and vomiting on examination. The visual acuity is decreased. The eye is congested. The cornea is hazy. The anterior chamber is shallow. And the eye is tony hard to touch. This is the clinical photograph. What is the diagnosis? So tell me what will you mark? What will you mark as the answer? Chalo, the options given to us are acute anterior uveitis, conjunctivitis, acute angle closure glaucoma and primary open angle glaucoma. So tell me, is me se konsa mark karna chahiye humko? Okay, one of you has answered and it is the correct answer. I hope everybody knows what is the answer. Yes, the answer is acute angle closure glaucoma and this is a very, very often asked question. So here, what are the pointers in the question? See, acute angle closure glaucoma, this is seen in elderly female patients, right? And the it is a painful red eye. The patient presents with a painful red eye. And the pain is so much that there may be associated nausea vomiting also. On examination, the cornea is hazy. There is a shallow anterior chamber. So see, this shallow AC is suggestive of angle closure. And the eyeball is stony hard to touch. Stony hard to touch means what? That the IOP is very, very high. And also see, there is one pointer in the, in the image. What can you say about the pupil here? The pupil is a mid-dilated pupil, correct? 
the pupil is a mid dilated pupil why because this attack of angle closure this is precipitated by midriasis it is precipitated by midriasis okay so these are the pointers in the question elderly female patient presents with a sudden onset painful red eye on examination ac is shallow pupil is mid dilated and the iop is high or the eyeball is stony hard to touch so all this gives us a diagnosis of acute angle closure glaucoma now whenever with this question is put up there is a confusion always with this option that is acute anterior uveitis because see acute anterior uveitis is also a painful red eye correct so here also you will have painful red eye so what are the key words that you have to look for in the question if it is a question on anterior uveitis na do cheeze hamesha mentioned hongi that they will always mention that there are cells and flare in the anterior chamber cells and flare in the anterior chamber will obviously be mentioned in the question second it will be mentioned that there are keratic precipitates or kps on the corneal endothelium and the third the pupil is myosed because of spasm so the pupil is not dilated the pupil is going to be myosed so look for these keywords in the question if you have a confusion see whenever we get a question on an acute that is painful red eye these are the two options we have to consider right so when we get a question on painful red eye look for these keywords if they have mentioned elderly female patient if they say that the ac is shallow the pupil is mid dilated the eyeball is stony hard to touch or they mention that the iop is high then the answer is acute angle closure glaucoma but if the question is on a painful red eye but the question says that there are cells and flare in the anterior chamber there are keratic precipitates on the endothelium and the pupil is myosed then acute anterior uveitis is the answer right now poag cannot be the answer because poag the presentation is chronic here the presentation is going to be chronic open angle glaucoma does not have an acute presentation okay sure. let's go to the next question yes what is the diagnosis here again image based question to so see there are like some whitish whitish things that you see at the pupillary margin what is this what are these whitish whitish things that we can see at the margin of the pupil what is the diagnosis it's a typical image based question but there are a couple of things i want to discuss from this also So, who will tell me what is the answer here? Is it an IUFB? Is it pseudo exfoliation? Is it vicious ring, or is it a result of trauma? Correct. I think all of you know the answer. The answer is PXF syndrome or pseudo exfoliation syndrome. Now, I want to discuss a couple of things about PXF and also show you this image. Now, this PXF syndrome or pseudo exfoliation syndrome. this is because of the production of a fibrillar substance and who produces this fibrillar substance this fibrillar substance this is produced by please remember this it is produced by the lens epithelium so this pxf syndrome or the pseudo exfoliation syndrome it is because of dip of production of a fibrillar substance which is produced by the lens epithelium and this substance gets deposited in different ocular structures giving rise to the different features of your pxf syndrome so number 1 is it will get deposited on the anterior lens capsule it gets deposited on the anterior lens capsule and when it gets deposited on the anterior lens capsule it gives rise to the pxf ring so see have a look at this image here so you can see this ring like deposit here so isko dekho yahan pe ek ring jaisa dikh raha hai na this ring on the anterior on the anterior capsule of the lens this is called as your pxf ring so this is the pxf ring theek okay? hai so this gets deposited on the anterior lens capsule giving rise to pxf ring second it gets deposited on the zonules it gets deposited in the zonules as a result of which it results in lens subluxation it will give rise to subluxation of the lens number 
it gets deposited at the trabecular meshwork in the angle of the anterior chamber it gets deposited in the trabecular meshwork and it gives rise to obviously glaucoma so that's called as pxf glaucoma pxf glaucoma and number 4 it gets deposited in the pupillary margin and when it gets deposited in the pupillary margin you have these dandruff like scales dandruff like scales which you saw in this image so see in the image that was given to us in the question these white white dots here at the pupillary margin here what you see these whitish scales or dandruff like scales at the pupillary margin this is suggestive of pxf material and also because of the deposition in the pupil you may have a poorly dilating pupil the pupil will not dilate well poorly dilating pupil this is also these are the features of pxf syndrome so one thing has been asked there is a high probability that others may be asked so just to go over this see pxf syndrome is because of the deposition of this fibrillar substance which is produced by the lens epithelium it gets deposited in these these places so anterior lens capsule giving rise to the pxf ring zonules giving rise to lens subluxation trabecular meshwork giving rise to pxf glaucoma and pupillary margin where you will get dandruff like scales and a poorly dilating pupil okay so this is about your pxf theek okay? hai chalo next question very very simple question which of the drugs increases uvo scleral outflow which of these drugs increases the uvo scleral outflow very 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 simple question so which of these drugs increases the uvo scleral outflow so timolol latanoprost pilocarpine and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors which of these increase the uvo scleral outflow correct it is latanoprost so it is latanoprost so taking the opportunity of this question i will just quickly discuss a couple of things so what are the classes of drugs which decrease aqueous humor production aqueous which are the drugs which increase aqua, which decrease aqueous humor production so drugs classes of drugs which decrease the aqueous humor production we have the beta blockers we have the alpha agonists and the third one is your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors so they are the ones which decrease the aqueous humor production now increasing uvo scleral outflow for increasing the uvo scleral outflow we have these what we just learned that is the pg analogs we have the pg analogs and the third category is which increase the trabecular outflow so increasing the trabecular outflow we have this new class of drugs that is our ro kinase inhibitors so these ro kinase inhibitors they increase the trabecular outflow and they are also neuroprotective they are also neuroprotective that is they increase the blood flow to the optic nerve so this this we have to memorize this chart also so drugs which decrease aqueous humor production are beta blockers alpha agonists and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors drugs which increase uvo scleral outflow are the pg analogs and trabecular outflow is increased by ro kinase inhibitors and they are also neuroprotective action and which is the class of drugs which act by dehydrating the vitreous so they don't act at all on the aqueous but they act as vitreous dehydrators they are your hyperosmotic drugs and which are the hyperosmotic drugs the hyperosmotic drugs are mannitol and glycerol so the hyperosmotic drugs that is mannitol and glycerol what they do is they don't act on the aqueous at all they are acting on the vitreous so they are our vitreous dehydrating drug okay so this chart please remember this 
that is drug which are the drugs and what are what is the mechanism of abhi ye jo next question hai na have a look at this question here a patient of poag has a known history of bronchial asthma which of the following should be prescribed as an anti glaucoma drug in this patient now which one will you choose all of them are pg analogs but which is the one that you will choose a patient of poag has a known history of bronchial asthma so now which one are we going to prescribe as the anti glaucoma drug in this patient yes the answer is latanoprost so this also brings us to this that it is not enough to know that they are pg analogs which are the pg analogs that are used in glaucoma please remember the names of these three latanoprost travoprost and bimetoprost and if you can please remember the percentages also these are the ones that are used in glaucoma so there are many pg analogs now all of them are not used as in anti anti glaucoma so latanoprost travoprost and bimetoprost are used and please remember if you can the percentages latanoprost is 0.005% travoprost 0.004% and bimetoprost is 0.03% and it is also available as 0.01% so isko yaad karna hai so which are the pg analogs that are used in glaucoma not all pg analogs will be, are used these are the ones that are used latanoprost travoprost and bimetoprost and if possible memorize the percentages also 0.005 for latanoprost 004 for travoprost 0.03 and 0.01 so bimetoprost is available in two strengths right so let's go to the next question a patient pain presents with pain and redness in the eye on examination there are keratic precipitates with cells and flare in the anterior chamber and the iop is around 40 mm of mercury which of the anti glaucoma drugs should not be used in this patient chal So let us see who knows the answer to this question. Chalo, tell me the answer. Manitol, beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, or PG analogs, which is not to be given. Which is not to be given here? Correct. The answer is PG analogs. Prostaglandin analogs is the answer. now the question is what is the diagnosis here so see there are few keywords mentioned here what are the keywords see keratic precipitates cells and flare in the anterior chamber and iop is high so we know it's glaucoma but what kind of glaucoma this is basically uveitic glaucoma correct so this is basically uveitic glaucoma or we can say this is inflammatory glaucoma now in uveit glaucoma or inflammatory glaucoma which are the classes of drugs that should not be given so one of them is pg analogs because pg analogs they increase the intraocular inflammation similarly brimonidine that is alpha receptor agonist should also not be given because both these they increase the intraocular inflammation both these they increase intraocular inflammation and also both of them they increase the risk of cystoid macular edema they increase the risk of cystoid macular edema so see one of the complications of prolonged uveitis is cystoid macular edema and these drugs they are known to increase the risk of cme so that's why these two classes these two drugs are contraindicated and also though we don't give theoretically pilocarpine is also contraindicated now why pilocarpine is indicated contraindicated because it increases the ciliary spasm so you know that in uveitis what do we give in uveitis we give atropine right we are going to give atropine that is a cycloplegic for decreasing the ciliary spasm and pilocarpine already it is causing meiosis and further increasing the ciliary spasm so theoretically pilocarpine is also contraindicated we never give pilo in these conditions but theoretically these three classes of drugs 
should not be given in patients who have uveitis. So in uveitic glaucoma, we are not supposed to give these three classes of drugs. Okay? Let's go to the next question. A patient presents with blurred vision, photophobia and eye pain. Now there is a shallow anterior chamber. He has been, ideally they should have mentioned that there is high intraocular pressure. They have not mentioned that. And he has been treated medically and surgically. But it has, it is, he has been treated medically and surgically. But he has not shown any improvement. Now, which is the procedure that needs to be done for this patient? So, see the, the device that has been used here. This is an express shunt. Here, this is an express shunt. So, these are actually glaucoma drainage devices. These are glaucoma drainage devices. So, I just wanted to show you the pictures of a few drainage devices. So, see this is the express shunt that you can see. Now, this that you see here, this is an Ahmed glaucoma valve. This is an Ahmed glaucoma valve. This picture that you see here, this is the bare walled implant. This is the bare weld implant. Now these two, these are your Molteno implant. These are the two Molteno implants. So Ahmed glaucoma valve, bare weld implant and these two are Molteno implants. And what you see here, this is your, this is your express shunt. So I just wanted that you should know the names of these glaucoma drainage devices. So what are the different glaucoma drainage devices? What you see here, this is the express shunt and this is AGV. The next one is bare weld implant and both these are Molteno implants. Okay. So this is another thing that I wanted you to know. Shall we go to the next question? A patient who has a previous history of undergoing LASIK Presence with cataract. What is the best formula here for IOL power calculation? So the options given to us are SRK2, AG's L, Hoffer Q and SRK T. So which is the best formula here? So who will tell me what is the best formula here? Which is the best formula here? Correct. It is Hages L. Hages L, this is the formula that is to be used, used here. Why? Because there is a patient who has undergone a previous corneal refractive surgery. For a patient who has previously undergone a corneal refractive surgery, this is, this is the formula that is to be used. Now, just to finish the uh, discussion, where do we use Hoffer Q formula? Hoffer Q formula is used when you have patients who are high hypermetrops. And SRK T formula, this is used for high myopic patients. So for high myops, we will use H for Hoffer Q. Sorry, for high myops, we will use SRK T. And for high hypermetrops, we will use offer Q and for post corneal refractive surgery you can use this formula that is Hages L. So Hages L for post corneal refractive surgery, offer Q for high hypermetropes and SRK T for high myopes. Okay, let's go to the next question. A 33 year old patient presents with loss of vision in the right halves of both eyes and where is the lesion located in the, in the optic pathway? So where is it located? So see what is this basically? What is this? What do we see here? So see this is the right eye and this is the left eye, correct? So this is the right eye and this is the left eye. 
this is the right eye and this is the left eye so the nasal part of one eye and the temporal part of the other eye are affected so this is a homonymous hemianopia so this is a homonymous hemianopia and the homonymous hemianopia is on which hand side the homonymous hemianopia is on the right hand side as they have said there is a right of vision in the right half so it's a right homonymous hemianopia so if it's a right homonymous hemianopia the site of the lesion is the left optic tract so site of the lesion is the left optic tract because the homonymous hemianopia is on the right side because they have mentioned its right halves of both the eyes so quickly ek bar sab all the types of visual field defects ko dekh lete hain so see this is the visual field defect of a patient now this is also a homonymous hemianopia but there is a clear area here so what do we call this what do we call this once again see it is a right sided defect na the darkening is on the right hand side so it's a right sided homonymous hemianopia with the central part is spared so it's called as homonymous hemianopia with macular or central sparing so homonymous hemianopia with macular or central sparing so the site of the lesion is if it is a right homonymous hemianopia the site of the lesion will be the left occipital lobe so central sparing or macular sparing you know that it is because of the occipital lobe so this is on the right hand side so right sided homonymous hemianopia with central sparing means site of lesion is on the left side that is the left occipital lobe okay just quickly look at the other defects so what will you call this what is this defect what is this defect called this defect is called as pi in the sky and what is the site of the lesion the site of the lesion is the temporal lobe so pi in the sky and site of the lesion is the temporal lobe now what is the exact opposite of this exact opposite of this ye hai this is called as pi on the floor and pi on the floor means site of the lesion is the parietal lobe pi on the floor and site of the lesion is the parietal lobe. right the last one sabse easy this is right this is left and the lesions are the darkening is on the temporal side so this is a bitemporal hemianopia and what is the site of lesion for bitemporal hemianopia i think all of you know this but a quick revision the site of the lesion is the optic chiasma yes and you are correct so see parietal lobe this is also called as the bomb's lobe right this is also called as the bomb's lobe that is the parietal lobe and this temporal lobe this is also called as your mayer's lobe this is also called as your mayer's lobe theek okay? hai now one question look at this question taking our discussion forward a patient has come with damage to the optic chiasma so he must be having a bitemporal hemianopia now which of the following may be a cause a patient with bitemporal hemianopia which of the following can be a cause so which of the following can be a cause if there is a patient with bitemporal hemianopia correct it is anterior communicating artery anterior communicating artery so look at this these are the important causes which involve the optic chiasma and may result in bitemporal hemianopia so pituitary adenoma or craniopharyngioma to everybody would have memorized memorize these two anterior communicating artery aneurysm and cavernous sinus thrombosis theek hai in dono ko yaad kar lo pituitary adenoma and craniopharyngioma to everybody would have you know it anyway 
but anterior communicating aneurysm artery aneurysm and cavernous sinus thrombosis are other causes right sure. next question very very simple question extra low of eyelashes behind the gray line is called as everybody should be able to answer this Yes, this I think everybody knows. Yes, it is distichiasis. It means second row of eyelashes. Second row of eyelashes. Simple one liner. Second row of eyelashes. What is the most common complication associated with this abnormality? Isme kya hai? What is this defect? This everybody knows, Deko, see there is a defect on the upper eyelid here. This is called as an eyelid coloboma. And because of the eyelid coloboma, what can you have? Obviously, see the cornea is exposed. So, you will have, correct, exposure keratopathy. Exposure keratopathy, this is the answer. Exposure keratopathy is the answer. Ye to bohat hi asaan hai. See, obviously when the patient closes the eye, the cornea will not, will be exposed. And so, there it will get damaged. Exposure keratopathy. So, this is an eyelid coloboma. Similarly, see, you can have this kind of coloboma. See, this is a picture of an iris coloboma. So, yaha pe dekho, the iris is deficient. This is a picture of an iris coloboma. And here, this is a picture of a chorioretinal coloboma. So, iris coloboma and chorioretinal coloboma. So, I just thought we will share these two images also. Iris coloboma and chorioretinal coloboma. Okay. Very, very simple question. An industrial worker was admitted to the hospital. And he has had an injury and there is a with hammer and chisel. So, we are expecting a metallic foreign body in the eye. So, isme se kaun sa nahi karna chahiye if there is a metallic foreign body. This is not ophthal also actually. If there is a metallic foreign body which is the investigation that we must not do. The investigation that we must not do is. Correct. MRI should not be done. MRI should not be done if it is a metallic foreign body. Very, very simple question. Isme sab, there is nothing to explain. This is also very simple. So, a 45 year old patient is coming to us with progressive weakness and see they are telling us that there is acetylcholine receptor antibodies. So, obviously this gives us a diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Now the question is, what is the most common ocular finding in this myasthenia gravis? The most common complicate, most common ocular finding in myasthenia gravis is? Yes, it is ptosis. So this is the answer. So ptosis can be the presenting feature in about 60% of cases. And this ptosis, it has a diurnal variation. So, it becomes worse towards the end of the day. It was by the end of the day. And it improves by ice test. So, ye positive ice test yaha pe mentioned nahi hai. So, if you put ice, the ptosis will improve. And also, the ptosis improves by edrophonium injection. So, dekho, aisa hota hai. After ice test or edrophonium injection, it is going to, this is the improvement that will be seen. So, this is suggestive of myasthenia gravis. This is suggestive of myasthenia gravis. So, yaha pe to tell, the question is very, very telltale. See, it is saying that there is weakness and there is acetylcholine receptor antibodies. So, we know it's myasthenia. Abhi question ye hai ki ocular myasthenia mein sabse common finding kya hai? So, there are different findings like you can have ptosis, diplopia, nystagmoid movements. See, different findings ho sakte hai. But the commonest finding is ptosis. And what is the special about this ptosis? That it will become worse by the end of the day. 
and it improves by positive eyes test if you put eyes and for some time you will see that it improves and also it may improve by hydrophonium injection okay a middle aged woman presents with bilateral proptosis restriction of eye movements and chemosis but her thyroid profile shows it is u thyroid what is the most probable cause here ab isme i think all of you know the answer i will tell you the trick yahan pe yes thyroid ophthalmopathy is commonly associated with grades that is hyperthyroidism but hamesha wo zaruri nahi hai so the answer is thyroid ophthalmopathy because baki sab jo hai na they are all unilateral they pre present with unilateral proptosis so pseudo tumor orbital lymphoma orbital cellulitis they are all they will all present with unilateral proptosis thyroid is the only one which may begin unilaterally but which is going to become bilateral it is bilateral it may begin unilaterally it is bilateral it may begin unilaterally okay so don't get confused by the fact that they are saying that it is u thyroid because thyroid ophthalmopathy can be associated with with u i mean maybe also you the status may be u thyroid also but the trick in the question is thyroid is the only one which is bilateral proptosis here okay let's go to the next question a patient presents with proptosis and sixth nerve palsy sixth nerve palsy so what is the diagnosis here what is the diagnosis so there is proptosis and there is sixth nerve palsy so this indicates see this is this indicates involvement of the cavernous sinus so please remember that cavernous sinus involvement may these are the following things you have to remember so when you have cavernous sinus involvement you will have proptosis the proptosis is initially unilateral but then it may become bilateral there will be chemosis there will be chemosis and in the cavernous sinus there is involvement of the third fourth and sixth nerves and it begins with the sixth nerve it begins with sixth nerve because the sixth nerve is inside the cavernous sinus so these are the features you have to look for when there is a question on cavernous sinus involvement so proptosis jo hai that will be there it begins unilaterally but later can become bilateral there will be chemosis and there is involvement of third fourth and sixth nerves but it begins with the sixth sixth nerve because the sixth nerve is in the inside the cavernous sinus whereas the third and fourth nerves are in the wall of the cavernous okay so that is why we are marking cavernous sinus thrombosis as the answer here next a patient presents with penetrating injury and a diagnosis of sympathetic ophthalmia is made which of the following is seen anterior uveitis pan uveitis sparse planitis or chronic anterior uveitis acute chronic anterior uveitis pan uveitis sparse planitis again a very very simple question so see the diagnosis is sympathetic ophthalmia penetrating injury so what is it what is the answer yes it is pan uveitis so sympathetic ophthalmitis this is bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis ye teeno words yaad kar lo bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis sympathetic ophthalmia is a bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis okay so this is the last question that a 35 year old woman is diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis what is the complication that is shown here once again see if you go by the image you will get confused 
the trick is it's a lady and there is rheumatoid arthritis and which of these conditions is actually associated with rheumatoid arthritis that is what is going to give you the answer if you look at the image as i image na ciliary staphyloma mein malignant melanoma may be ho sakta hai they may look similar so the trick in the question is this that it's a lady and there is rheumatoid arthritis and here what you get is scleromalacia perforans this is a type of necrotizing anterior scleritis this is a necrotizing anterior scleritis which is associated with long standing rheumatoid arthritis so once again see this is this is a lesson that you have to look at not the image first try to look at the history first because if you look just at the image it's very easy to get confused with ciliary staphyloma because ciliary staphyloma bhi looks very similar only okay so these are the questions that i had in store for you so i wanted to go through the first part slowly because i had collected i wanted to discuss the important topics some of the questions are simple one liner so i just went through them but the topics that i have discussed i feel these are the ones that you have to learn properly because see pyqs may not be repeated but the topics will be repeated okay so i hope this session has been useful for all of you and uh, i have managed to uh discuss the topics that are more volatile and given you clarity about some images and some difficult concepts you have been a very very enthusiastic audience i must say which has helped to keep up the tempo of the class because it is very very difficult to conduct an mcq based session if the audience is not interactive and you have managed to keep up the tempo of the class till the very end so thank you very much students for being so enthusiastic and i'm happy to see that you are all well prepared and uh, as far as ophthal is concerned and uh, do revise the pyqs the pyq topics look at the high yield images not only for ophthal but also for the other subjects and all the very very best for your exam okay so just to remind you tomorrow we will be having this continuing this print session with dr santosh patil so tomorrow and day after you will be having medicine revision and we all know that medicine is the most important topic as far as most important subject as far as our exam is concerned maximum number of questions so do attend this session and revise your medicine also so thank you very much everyone